Is this the only button I need to operate? This right. one. What, what's that one over there? Okay, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to uh, be here before this group. I was here last year for three hours, and this year they expanded me to four hours to see if I could get it right, I guess. So this afternoon you're going to have uh, three hours of pure bovine lesions, and tomorrow we'll finish up with about an hour on, on uh, some of the sheep conditions. Um, I'd like to kind of make this so that, that we can get a little participation here. I hope to also be kind of uh, stimulating some board-type uh, thought processes as we go through. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to have a little interaction here because I'd like to, to get the group involved with this. I know otherwise by, by 5 o'clock I'll have half the folks in the audience sleeping. So, Without further ado, I guess we'll get started here with some of the conditions. Typical board slide, right? <laughs> Describe that one. Um, <clears throat> Uranyl acetate crystals, what that was. Um, first thing we're going to start off is going through some of the bovine liver conditions. And of course, uh, there are numerous things that affect uh, the livers of cattle. Uh, one of the most common, of course, is the fatty liver and the fatty liver syndrome. And as you can see here, this is supposedly a normal liver in the bottom. I can get this thing to work. There you go. Normal liver, even though I think it's a little darker than most of your bovine livers are, usually they're more of a mahogany color. And of course, at the top, we have a, a a fatty liver from pregnant animal near term. Um, these things, of course, are very common in pregnant cows. Usually you start seeing a, a fat deposition within a couple weeks of, of uh, delivery. And usually, instead of being in a, in a deficit of, of energy, these animals have some type of a hormonal change that causes the deposition of, liver, or of, of uh, fatty acids in the liver. And then right after the animal's uh, calf, they have an increased demand for energy for milk production and they start mobilizing body fat. Usually it comes from the subcutaneous fat as well as they start breaking down some of their muscle fibers and you get free fatty acids that go to the liver and the liver cannot metabolize them properly and you get a buildup of, of uh, triglycerides in the cytoplasm. And usually uh, most pregnant animals right after calving usually have about a 20% fat uh, concentration in the liver but in some animals it can be as high as 70% of the weight is, is uh, fatty acids in the liver. So you can see we have major problems with that um, usually by, oh, about three months or so after the animals have calved, the, the normal concentration of fat in a bovine liver is about 5%. And of course, sometimes in animals that have severe deposition of fat, uh, it gets, becomes so massive that it causes problems with liver function, and they become ketotic and develop nervous ketosis. So it can be a major problem for cattle. And of course, when you start seeing fatty livers, you start seeing a pattern, you know, very typical with, with uh, that deposition are usually around the central vein as you get portal triads. Let's try again. That woke you up, didn't it? Okay, let's try that again. Um, like I said, we're looking at a fatty liver, and this again is the usual distribution of, of the, the fat in the liver. And if you get a real close up shot, you can start seeing again, you have a, a pattern with a distribution. Usually around the central vein, you have most of the fat, and uh, the portal triad is kind of almost in a nutmeg appearance, again, with the fat around the central vein. Okay, we've got another bovine liver here. Um, on a board exam, how about two morphologics? Okay, first one you'd want to be looking at are these things, telangiectasis, telang liver. And of course, this one is a fairly common condition in cattle, and it also occurs in other species, but the most, most commonly seen in cattle, um, known as tension lipidosis. Um, on boards, more than likely, they'd, they'd probably ask you for, for two morphologics, and they may ask you for the pathogenesis of tension lipidosis. And of course, some people propose that basically what it is are there are fibrin tags of some type along the edge of the, of the liver, and that's usually where you find most of these lesions along the edge. You have a fibrin tag that hooks onto the body wall or some other organ or some other lobe of the liver, and that pulls on that, on that part of the parenchyma, cuts down the blood, 
blood flow into that area of the liver, and you get a relative uh, hypoxia, which allows the deposition of fat. So tension lipidosis and telangiectasis. Okay, another liver. Again, we have a couple lesions. This is telangiectasis. What about these other lesions? Very common in feedlot cattle. This is what's known as a sawdust liver. And basically, sawdust livers, or these little lesions are, if you looked at them histologically, all you would find would be focal dropout or necrosis of hepatocytes. And at some times, you can find uh, focal infiltrates of neutrophils. But usually, it's just a degeneration of, of a small foci of hepatocytes. Okay, what's the pathogenesis of, of uh, things such as sawdust livers and telangiectasis? Um, the true pathogenesis is not known. Some people propose, first of all, which comes first, or is there any association between telangiectasis and sawdust livers? Maybe and maybe not. Um, some people propose that sawdust livers may be initiated by a deficiency of vitamin E selenium. You get damage to hepatocyte membranes, focal necrosis of hepatocytes, where you actually get a loss of hepatocytes, loss of parenchyma. And then some people say, well, maybe what happens is, is this parenchy is, parenchyma is removed, and then you end up having a, a space in there that's filled by blood, which is basically what telangiectasis is. But one of the reasons, or one of the things that speaks against this is how come you don't have telangiectasis in every, every area where you have sawdust? So really, the, the pathogenesis of both telangiectasis and sawdust livers and cattle is unknown at the present time. <coughs> Just another uh, liver showing areas of telangiectasis. Sometimes these things be, can be very large. Um, with inspection, usually telangiectasis is, we don't assume it's of any uh, public health significance, but usually when they have extensive lesions of telangiectasis, the livers are condemned. You know, people don't want to go into the grocery store and find a liver that's full of, of red areas like this. So for aesthetic purposes, they're condemned on inspection. Just another one showing telangiectasis. And you can see these are very large lesions. And of course, you'd also want to be considering things like hemangiomas or large, large areas of necrosis. Um, some, some of your fungal lesions will look like this. So there's a variety of different things you'd have to think about when you start seeing large areas of, of, uh, of red in the bovine liver. OK, again, looking at a liver. And this is a chronic passive congestion. This is a nutmeg liver. Looks like the surface or the outer coat of a nutmeg. And basically, what you see in, in chronic passive congestion is a central vascular uh, accumulation of red material from, from the backup of blood around the central veins. And then you start seeing uh, fibrosis and, and uh, lipidosis in the, in the periportal areas. Chronic passive congestion, very common in cattle. More of the same type of thing. This one's a little more chronic yet, and there's more, more fibrous connective tissue in this. And also, you'll notice that the color is a lot darker. And of course, the color, the darkness, is probably associated with the connective tissue, but also more, more than likely with the, the decreased oxygen concentration in the blood that's going through the liver. And of course, when we started seeing chronic passive congestion in the liver, you started also seeing fluid accumulation in other parts of the body, ascites, those type of things. And of course, sometimes when you do have uh, chronic passive congestion, the livers get the real dark blue appearance to them. And again, that is due to hypoxia or low oxygen content in here. Chronic passive congestion. Sometimes with chronic passive congestion, you start seeing lesions like this. Again, you have the real dark, dark blue uh, appearing liver with a thickened fibrotic capsule and edematous, and you start seeing ascites. And in some animals with chronic passive congestion, you can find uh, a massive accumulation of fluid throughout the carcass. And basically what we have here is an anisarch or a dropsic, dropsic type condition. Um, some of these animals can have hundreds of pounds of fluid in their tissues. When you open them up, you find like the mesentery over here is just chuck full of, of uh, fluid. The whole thing is full of fluid. You may find 30 or 40 gallons of fluid free in the abdominal cavity as well as, as uh, fluid in the thoracic cavity. So this is an anisarch or a dropsic type condition. And if you start cutting into the subcutaneous tissues or the mesentery, you just find whole fluid like this. It'll just stand there in the carcass. It'll just drip for, for hours after, after slaughter. Usually these things are associated with uh, hepatic problems. And the most common lesion that they're secondary to is, is hepatic fibrosis or, or cirrhosis. And you can actually get high tension in the liver, backup of fluid through the portal system, and a leakage of fluid out into the abdominal cavity and into the other tissues. And of course, this is the, the listens capsule of the liver from, a, from an a animal that has hepatic fibrosis or cirrhosis. Um, here's a cross section of that same thing. You can see massive accumulations of fibrous connective tissue in here. And then you start seeing small nodules of, of hepatocytes basically, which is a, a nodular hyperplasia. And of course, usually these things are non-functional. 
Um, you may have what appear to be normal looking hepatocytes, but they do not form the normal acinar structures, and therefore they, they cannot function properly as far as uh, bile secretion and those type of things, even though they may be able to function somewhat, somewhat efficiently at, at uh, detoxification of compounds. And of course, these things are often secondary to, to uh, toxins. We call these our chronic toxic hepatitis, uh, secondary to things like pyrolizidine alkaloids. Um, aflatoxins, a wide variety of things. Usually when they get to this stage, and, and in most toxic uh, hepatitises in cattle, it, you get to this stage and there's no way to actually trace back and see what caused these lesions in the animals. Chronic toxic hepatitis. Or the same type of thing with a, with a hepatic cirrhosis, got fibrosis with, with macronodular hyperplasia. Same type of thing again. Very common in older animals. Again, hepatic fibrosis or cirrhosis with nodular hyperplasia. You see the extensive uh, infiltration of fibrous connective tissue throughout the parenchyma. Okay, um, another bovine liver. Start seeing lesions like this, and most people would feel very, very comfortable calling those abscesses. And in that situation, these are, in fact, abscesses. This, this is necrobacillosis caused by Fusobacterium necrophorum. But this one is, is fairly easy to see that these are abscesses, but some of the other livers I may show you later you'll have an awful time differentiating abscess from, from neoplasia. Um, oftentimes with uh, necrobacillosis, refusobacterium necrophorum, the lesions, instead of being the, the, the caseous abscesses you expect the, with a coagulation necrosis, a lot of times when you cut into abscesses of necrobacillosis, they're kind of hard and firm and, and they are not very fluid. So you start seeing lesions like this. When you cut into them, you just cut right through and you actually don't even get much exudate on the knife. So necrobacillosis. More of the same thing here. Now, this, again, is a necro. These look like abscesses, but sometimes you have a hard time saying, hey, is that a tumor? Could be a tumor, could be a kind of coccus, could be, could be uh, congenital cysts. You have to cut into some of these things to tell. And even then, sometimes you can't. <clears throat> again, this is another lesion of necrobacillosis. And sometimes, of course, you can, you can see them coming through the capsule. And at times, these will even rupture, rupture through the capsule and, and uh, allow exudate to go into the abdominal cavity. Okay, and one of, the, one of the main things that we see in cattle, and this is fairly common, is, of course, liver abscesses are, are very common, especially in fat cattle. But at times, you'll get, you'll get abscesses that will extend into the major vessels of the, of the liver and rupture. And that's what we've had here. This is a ruptured abscess that's healed over. And, of course, once the, whatever organism is uh, in, gains access into these vessels, they go and cause a pyemia and a, and a bacterial septicemia. Um, pyemias and bacterial septicemias in cattle, the, the two main sources uh, for these are ruptured liver abscesses and bacterial endocarditis are the two main causes of, of pyemias in cattle. Okay, and of course, they can go any place in the body. Necrobacillosis or Fusobacterium necrophorum is a, is a nasty organism in cattle. And usually people say, well, it's just necro. It causes liver abscesses and foot rot and not much other problem. But that's not the case. And, and we find widespread, widespread pyemias with necrobacillosis. And this just happens to be a case where we have a vertebral abscess. But they cause pneumonias, um, cause lesions in pyrus patches in the GI tract and kidney. Any place you find abscesses, they can be full. They can be caused by necrobacillosis. Um, sometimes we find brain abscesses, other other things like this. And of course, necrobacillosis is a is an organism that, that causes severe fatal metritis, often secondary to dystocias. If you got a if you got a vet out there, or a farmer out there uh, helping a cow with a dystocia, and he goes in there and contaminates the uterus. It's very common to find the animal dead a couple of days later from a from a fusobacterium-induced uh, metritis. Um, we'll get in a little further into the, the pathogenesis of liver abscesses when we start talking about uh, some of our other systems. Anybody have any idea? If I ask you what what the pathogenesis of, of liver abscesses was, I think that'd be a very fair board uh, question. Say, put up, put up lesions like some of these abscesses, say this is caused by Fusobacterium necrophorum, and ask for a pathogenesis. And basically, what they would expect you to say is that these things are secondary to, to uh, rumen ulcers and go into the things on rumen ulcers. And I'll talk about that a little later as I get into the GI tract. Okay, we've got a uh, liver here. And you start seeing a, a single large area like this that, that almost is fairly well demarcated from the normal parenchyma. Um, sometimes you'll even find a little white line along through there if it becomes a little more chronic. Basically, it looks like an infarct. Bovine liver, start seeing lesions like that. You should start thinking about the different things that, that, that uh, cause infarct-looking lesions in bovine livers. Condition also found in sheep. Same thing, basically a large infarct here. 
Sometimes they're not nearly that large. Sometimes more hemorrhagic can cause more focal lesions. Um, on boards, I may want to ask you, uh, give me a disease diagnosis on that one. And that, that is bacillary hemoglobinuria, caused by Clostridium hemolyticum. And also on boards, I may say, uh, what other thing is always or almost always associated with, with hemoglobinuria, bacillary hemoglobinuria? What, what other agent initiates this lesion? And they're going to expect you to say fasciola hepatica. Almost invariably, you'll only find vascular hemoglobin, vascular hemoglobinuria in areas where the, where the, the fluke, uh, fasciola hepatica, is an endemic. So what happens here? Basically, the, the organism, Clostridium hemolyticum, is present in the soil, and it's also present in, in, uh, in the animal. And the animal consumes the organism. The organism somehow uh, get into the portal system, go and seed down in the liver. The liver is traumatized by flukes migrating through the parenchyma. That changes the oxidation, uh, the oxygen concentration in there, which allows these anaerobic organisms to, to uh, produce and start producing exotoxins. And in bacillary hemoglobinuria, they produce two different types of exotoxins, one of which causes necrosis of the liver, and the second of which causes the other lesion associated with bacillary hemoglobinuria, which is a, it's a hemolysin that, that destroys red blood cells in the blood, in the bloodstream. You get the hemolysis, which leads to, to uh, hemoglobinuria. So with bacillary hemoglobinuria, you get liver lesions, and you get hemoglobin in the urine, in the, in the urine, port wine color urine. Bacillary hemoglobinuria, very similar to black disease of sheep. Okay, another liver lesion. Again, we have what, what most of us would feel very comfortable looking at these. This looks like a more typical liver abscess. It's walled off. It has a, the exudative, the, the pussy look to it. And uh, some of these are starting to dry out a little bit. These, these liver abscesses are secondary to uh, umphloflebitis. This happened to be in a calf that had navel ill. And of course, you'd probably find endocarditis associated with this, arthritis, some of those type of lesions. OK, um, I'm going to show you a few slides here that, that uh, I'll almost guarantee that none of you have ever seen. And with meat inspection in the last four years now, we have had uh, 22 cows cows and calves that have been identified, most of which have come from the northeast eastern part of the United States. And basically, um, the kill floor vet who has found these things, first thing he called up, he says, Doc, I've got these fluorescent green livers. Don't know what they are. I've never seen these things before. Uh, this plant kills, slaughters hundreds of thousands of animals a year, and he's never seen it in cattle before. But it started appearing about four years ago. And this is what it looks like. You start seeing these livers that, instead of being the normal mahogany color, are kind of a light green or green yellow. And you can kind of see there's a special, there's a pattern to it. And uh, this, is, this is a true color. And sometimes they're even a little more green than this. Sometimes they look like a, like an ice, uh, like a grasshopper ice cream drink. OK? So we've had 22 cases, all of which have had liver lesions that look like this. And the, and the liver lesions are in a pattern like this. That you're looking through the capsule. These are areas of tension lipidosis. But these are the lesions we're looking at in the liver. And, and basically, you get these small little uh, prints through the parench throughout the parenchyma. And if you, look, if you look at these histologically, they're in the portal areas. And when you take a cross-section of those livers, again, you can see an accumulation of this, this greenish-yellow material, widespread throughout the liver, hepatic lymph nodes. And every one of the cases have looked like this, just full of green material. Sometimes the lymph nodes would be 50 to 75% green material. And this is a tenacious material that sticks right to the surface of the, of the, of the knife when you cut through it. We've also found it in, and this happens to be a, a hepatic lymph node again. We found it in the renal lymph nodes, the mesenteric lymph nodes, the gastric lymph nodes, and also in the kidney. And here again, it almost looks like a tuberculosis type thing. And when you, when you cut it, it almost feels like tuberculosis, although it's never mineralized. Has any, have any of you folks seen any lesions like this before? OK. Again, this is the gastric lymph node. You can, always, you can actually see it through the surface of, of this lymph node. And when you look at these things, they're, they're chuck full of crystalline material. And uh, the bottom line, you're going to have to wait uh, for a vet path article probably about the end of the, time, end of the year to figure out what this is. But I'll just tell you that it has to do with, with the metabolism of, of some of your purine bases. So it's an excellent condition. And you should be on the outlook for it. And, and this has never been, never been presented any place before. So you've seen this. And uh, when it comes out, you, you kind of have to see it grossly in, 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 in a color photograph to really appreciate the lesions. So we've seen 22 cases of this in, in, uh, in animals from four months to, uh, to aged adult cows. Okay. Um, other liver lesions. 
We're looking at a, a liver here. We have started having these black streaks throughout the liver. And of course, most people are, are fairly adept at recognizing fluke tracts in the liver. Of course, you don't want to think about melanosis, but uh, fluke could have to be your number one consideration here. And that's, that indeed is what that is. Um, one of the things that's very common is that, that uh, well, people submit cases that they'll say, we've got a melanoma in this lymph node, and usually it's hepatic lymph node, and, and they're sure they have melanosis or melanoma. And if people send lymph nodes like that into you and you look at them, unless you're thinking about flukes, you're probably going to diagnose it as melanosis. And all of a sudden, you'll be looking at these things, and, and you'll come across a fluke egg or areas of mineralization, which make you think that it's not melanosis, that it's associated with fluke migration. Very common to find that in hepatic lymph nodes. This is what the, what the flukes look like. This is fasciola hepatica. And this happens, these were in a bile duct. That's where you find them. Right now, they're not laying in the bile duct, but that's where you find them. Um, it's what they look like, usually about an inch or so long. Fasciola hepatica, the common liver fluke. And here they are. This happens to be a bile duct that's opened up, and here's the flukes hiding in the bile duct. If you look at this, it's, it's markedly thickened. You get a chronic cholangiohepatitis associated with the fluke migration. Like I said, usually you find them just in the, in the bile ducts. You don't find them migrating through the parenchyma. Fasciolaides magna, you find in the parenchyma, and they cause more damage, whereas fasciola hepatica doesn't get out in the parenchyma like, like magna does. <coughs> of course, there's a, there's a third type of fluke in, in cattle, in, in cows, and I think that'd be a very fair board question to ask you what the third type of fluke would be. And this, this is the fluke. And again, this is in a, in a, in a bile duct. It's thickened and fibrotic. And we're, we find, now there's probably 100 little flukes in here. And of course, they're going to ask you what the name of this one is, or what's the common name. This is a lancet fluke, Dicrocilium dendriticum. More common uh, in the northeastern part of the United States, where some of your other flukes, like Fasciola hepatica, are found more commonly down in the, in the Mississippi uh, Delta area. Dicrocilium dendriticum. These are, these are so small that if you don't look for them very closely, when I took this photograph, it's one of those things, unless you're really looking for them, when you open a bile duct, you'll miss them because they're smaller than your, your littlest finger, your smallest fingernail. Just to put them in perspective of the different sizes, this is Fasciolides magna. This is Fasciola hepatica, and these are Dicrocilium dendritica. And you can see this is, this is a quarter of an inch right here. So, I mean, these things are, are very minute, and if you're not really looking for them, you won't find them. Dicrocilium dendriticum. Okay, this right here would be an excellent slide. They, they kind of like to throw things like this on. They wouldn't even tell you that was gallbladder. They kind of expect you to know that. And that's just squamous metaplasia of the gallbladder. Don't know what the cause is. Probably of very little importance. Just, a, a, just one, th one of the things that's going to cost you a couple of points on the boards, probably. Squamous metaplasia of the gallbladder. Okay, another liver. Start seeing lesions like this. You know, you, when you start seeing these things and the irregularity around the outer surface, that makes you think of tumor rather than abscess. It doesn't have a smooth abscess wall around here, but you'd also want to be thinking about granuloma of some type. This happens to be a bile duct carcinoma. Well, I couldn't tell whether this was a primary liver tumor or a, or a tumor that had uh, metastasized to the liver, but it was a bile duct carcinoma. And of course, tumors always look different, and this happens to be another bile duct carcinoma. Now, my first guess on that one would be a lymphoma, but that was a bile duct carcinoma. So tumors, you can't just tell by looking at them grossly what they're going to be. Um, Pays, uh, pays to pay special attention to livers and, and different things when you're looking at uh, tumors. And this happens to be an hepatic portal vein that's opened up. We had a hepatoma or hepatocellular carcinoma in this animal. And here we have lesions that have invaded through the wall of the vessel, and they're into the, into the vessel. And from here, of course, they break off and go to the lungs and other parts of the body. So it's always kind of handy. And, and uh, once in a while, you'll kind of find a, find a special little treat for you when you start looking at things very closely like this. And you can actually see how, how tumors spread throughout the body. OK, we're done with the liver. We're going to get on with the, with the GI tract now, um, looking at a bovine tongue. You start seeing lesions like this. You know, you, on boards, they'd probably ask you for three or four differential diagnoses. What causes ulcerative lesions of the tongue? And you'd go through some of your things like BVD and blue tongue and a wide variety of uremia and whatever else. And uh, you know, you, but there are certain other things that can cause these, too. And this ha animal happened to be from the southwest. Anybody know what those things are? <coughs> They're grass-ons. Grass-ons in, in, in the southwest especially cause major problems, and they cause focal punched-out ulcerative lesions in the tongue of cattle. OK, another bovine tongue. We, think we find a, a thickened surface to it. Um, 
Any list of differentials on that one at all? You know, you'd be thinking about a hyperkeratosis of some type, right? And that would have to be one of your number one rules, rule outs. This happens to be uh, dermatophilosis, dermatophilus congolensis. And I wouldn't expect you to know that, but there's just certain things that we're trying to, to demonstrate here that, that uh, whenever you see a gross lesion, you should be able to come up with three or four different differential diagnoses. Just because you can find the most common one doesn't mean that, that that's going to make your diagnosis. You have, to, you have to be able to list almost all the things that cause it before you can diagnose them. So dermatophilosis. Usually it causes more of a skin problem than a tongue problem, but it can occur in any surface. And a few years ago when I took boards, we had a dermatoph dermatophilosis in the rumen as a histo slide. So, you know, they like to find different things, and you need to be looking for things out of their ordinary position before you can diagnose them. Okay, uh, another open up. We're looking at the inner surface of a, of a bovine mouth, and we start seeing these, these raised lesions with kind of shrunken centers. Sometimes they'll even have a little red around the outer surface. You know, well, is that dermatophilosis too? No. Um, we start thinking about other lesions. We find them around the teeth. Um, anybody have any suggestions what that one may be? I'm, I'm going to show you three or four different things, and I'm basically trying to prove or trying to demonstrate that I can't tell by, grossly by looking at these things what they are. I've got to do a histopath or other, other diagnostic procedures to pick that up. Um, give me another slide and see if you can diagnose it for me. Papular stomatitis which is a proliferative type lesion. You get hyperplasia of, of the epithelium and ballooning, ballooning degeneration of the deeper layers of the epithelium. Sometimes, this is a more chronic lesion. Sometimes in the acute lesion, you'll start finding areas that have a red rim around the outer surface and a, and a pale shrunken area in the center. Those are the more classic early lesions. This is papular stomatitis. You usually find it in the mouth, but you can find it down in the, in the four stomachs. I have a beautiful slide of, of this lesion in the reticulum. Beautiful board slide. Get the, the great uh, the pox type lesion in the reticulum. And if you're not thinking about it, you won't be thinking about papular stomatitis. Like I said, the intercytoplasmic eosinophilic inclusion bodies, pox inclusions. And oftentimes you'll get an uh, infiltration of mononuclear cells and some neutrophils down in the, in the lamina propria. Okay? Same thing, right? Sure looks like it. I mean, I'd have to be thinking about, about uh, papular stomatitis. Um, it's not what it is. Same, same thing here in the tongue. This is X disease, chlorinated naphthalenes. With, this was a big problem back in the late 40s and early 50s, and it's not a problem right now, but it's of historic significance. And, and they may throw something like this at you at the boards. And of course, if they give you something like this, they may even tell you that it's X disease. And then they'll ask you, well, what's the morph or what's the histologic changes you would expect to find? Well, it's hyperkeratosis. Or, and then they're going to say, well, what's the pathogenesis? Chlorinated naphthalenes, uh, first of all, chlorinated naphthalenes were, were common in wood preservatives, and they were also added to some of your lubricants back in the late 40s and early 50s. And of course, once they found out what the problem was, this killed a lot of animals. Once they found out what the problem was, they removed it from these things. But what actually is a pathogenesis? What causes lesions of hyperkeratosis? We can get them throughout the, throughout the skin and throughout the GI tract, and that's what you've got here in the esophagus. And also, these are more acute lesions in the bovine tongue. And you can start seeing a dermatitis, extensive hyperkeratosis and dermatitis. And almost always associated with this condition is extreme lacrimization. Animals are tearing. You start seeing animals that have problems with the skin, with thickened skin, and with tearing problems, you should start thinking about vitamin A. And somehow chlorinated naphthalenes inhibit or, or uh, cause a deficiency of vitamin A, and you start getting the changes you expect to see in vitamin A deficiency. So chlorinated naphthalene toxicity. It's not there anymore, but it was. OK. Um, looking at an esophagus, hard to see what you're actually looking at. And I'm sure the people in the back maybe can't pick this up. But the people in the front, if they look at this, they can see a little serpentine lesion that's, that's in, the ep in the epidermis here. And this is what it is. And this is the, the thread worm, Gondulinema pulchrum. No big deal. It's the, the, lesion, the, the parasite causes no problem to the animal, but it's just one of those things where if you're looking at the, at the squamous epithelial surface, you find the worm actually buried, buried right in the epidermis, in the epithelium. Gondulinema. Cow, we're looking at, we've got an erosion on the muzzle, and we start seeing some erosion around the teeth. More erosions and ulcerations. Same thing here of the lips and gingiva and around the teeth. If you start seeing things like this, there ought to be about three or four different disease processes that, that come to your mind. 
And they, there again, they're going to ask you to, to list three or four different diseases. And you're going to be thinking BVD, blue tongue, malignant catarrhal fever, um, uremia, some of those things that should come to your mind when you start seeing lesions like this. So you go on and you find lesions in the hard palate where you have ulcerations and excoriations covered by necrotic material here. Lesions over here, ulcerations. Conjunctivitis and keratitis. What we're looking at here is BVD. Okay, and this is, these are erosions and ulcerations in the esophagus. Very common to find. Same thing. This happens to be where it's been denuded. This is still some of the epithelium on here, and this is where the epithelium is gone. BVD. Pillars of the rumen with similar lesions, ulcerations, and, and erosions. And of course, this is the classic lesion of BVD, classic lesion of mucosal disease. And basically, you know, somebody on board would ask you what this is, where this is located, pathogenesis of it. And basically, what we're looking at is ileum, and what we get is, get is an area of necrosis over the pyrus patches. Um, BVD has two different aspects to it. One is, is regular bovine virus diarrhea, and the second one is mucosal disease. Bovine virus di diarrhea, as a rule, is not a major problem for most animals. Usually animals that get BVD show very little disease and recover very rapidly if they do get it. But mucosal disease is, is a disease that's almost invariably fatal to, to animals. And uh, both, of these, both of these conditions are caused by a, a, a pestivirus. And with mucosal disease, the animals become infected with this virus in utero before the, before the animal is 120 days old. And at that stage, the animal is still immunotolerant. They become infected with a, with a non-cytopathic pestivirus, with a BVD virus, a non-cytopathic one. And at that time, the animal recognizes that as self. So it, it looks at that as self and it says, yeah, we can have this. It's OK to, to get exposed to this virus. So what happens is the animal has this virus, and it, it clears the virus and goes on. And sometime later in life, the animal gets exposed to the cytopathogenic BVD virus. And the animal still recognizes this virus as OK itself. And the animal becomes viremic with, with mucosal disease virus. The virus attacks epithelial cells, lymphoid cells, and you get the typical lesions of, of bovine virus diarrhea, mucosal disease. Any questions on that? OK, these are the, the typical lesions you expect to find. These are pyrus patches. The normal one down here, there is a lymphoid tissue in the ileum. And this is a pyrus patch of an animal that has BVD. And you can see the, the epithelium over this is denuded. And the lymphocytes in pyrus patches are, are necrotic. They've been destroyed by the virus. And oftentimes, the whole thing kind of collapses. You can, and you, you get a, a crater down there. And you can see this usually through the cirrhosal surface of, of the intestines. So that's typical of BVD. And of course, if you start seeing lesions like this, you better be thinking about one other disease and only one other disease. And what's that one? Renderpest. That's right. Okay, and this, this happens to be a lesion of BVD in the colon. It doesn't just get the ileum, it can get any place along the GI tract. These are erosions and ulcerations, again, where the virus has infected the epithelial cells and destroyed them, and uh, you get major lesions like this. <clears throat> and of course, BVD can get other parts of the body. You can, it can get the coronary band, where you get a coronitis, you can actually get a sloughing of the foot. You can get other lesions associated with BVD if this animal become infected in utero. Basically, we've got a microophthalmia here, normal bovine eye from an animal that age, and a very small eye. You can also get things like retinal dysplasia, optic neuritis, a wide variety of different lesions associated with BVD. This happens to be a partial hypotrichosis, improper uh, hearing of this animal, secondary to BVD virus. And of course, you get the other lesions like cerebellar hypoplasia, um, hydranencephaly, Lesions like that from BVD virus. Okay, um, you're taking boards right now, and they give you this slide. And on the thing, they say bovine, and they say the animal had BVD. And they want you to, to tell them what the histologic changes are here and the pathogenesis. I think this would be an excellent board slide. Okay, they're going to they're gonna expect you to find out, to know what lesions. And, happen in the kidney of animals that have BVD virus. Of course, you're going to say, well, those look, you know, they're kind of widespread, and they look like they could be in the area of, of glomeruli. Bingo. I got that right. So let's go on to the next one. This is what it is. 
This is, a, this is an animal that's secondary to, uh, this animal has a persistent bovine virus diarrhea virus, a viremia. And you start looking at these glomeruli and you find that they're highly cellular and they have a lot of membrane. And basically what this, the morphologic on this would be mesangial proliferative glomerulopathy. And, and the pathogenesis on that would be you have a persistent antigen antibody complex formation or migration circulation throughout the system and you get a deposition of this on the basement membranes of the, of the glomeruli. So this is an antigen antibody complex disease, secondary to BVD virus. Okay, another bovine, looking at, again, the mouth. And I just put this one on to show you that, that render pest looks very similar to BVD. That's what we're going to show you, four or five different slides of render pest. This happens to be the esophagus with erosions and ulcerations. That slide is probably 50 years old. Um, one of the classic lesions of both BVD and Renderpest are, are the lesions that happen in the abomasum. And you start seeing lesions in the folds of the abomasum like this. Sometimes they have a, they have a very pale center and with a hemorrhagic rim around the outer surface. And, and those things are, are highly suggestive of bovine virus diarrhea. And of course, this happens to be the ileum with uh, the striping over the pyrus patch again. BVD or Renderpest. This one was Renderpest. But I, I don't know how you could tell the difference. That's the carousel. Any questions so far? It's going too fast? Anybody still awake? <clears throat> Probably starting to get, look, get tired of looking at bovine muzzles, right? <clears throat> Just put this one on to say that there are other things that cause lesions in the bovine mouth and that can look like BVD and some of your other viruses. And this happens to be blue tongue. Blue tongue is not common in cattle, but about 5 to 10 percent of the animals that do get infected with blue tongue will show clinical lesions. And these are, these are probably not typical. This, these are severe cases, but that's, that's a lesion of blue tongue. We get the, the, the hyperemia and sometimes the cyanosis associated with it. And you get the erosions and the ulcerations of the, of the palate, or the gingiva, I should say, in here. Sometimes, it's kind of hard to tell, and that's when you get some ulcerations and erosions, and, and this is not a good example, but sometimes the tongue is blue and cyanotic. That's where it gets the name from. And you can get erosions and, and ulcerations, again, of, throughout the GI tract. This happens to be the esophagus. And, of course, you can get lesions of the foot and the teats and other areas, and it's very common to find them in these areas where you have less hair, and you can see the cyanotic or the hyperemic appearance. And that's what you've got here is you, got, you get inflammation of the coronary band and, and of the skin here. And in severe cases, the animals can actually slough these hooves. So that's uh, blue tongue virus. And of course, other things associated with blue tongue virus are hydranencephaly and other genetic or congenital type problems. On boards, they may, may tell you that that's blue tongue and ask you for, for two other animal diseases caused by that agent. And they're going to want something like uh, epizootic hemorrhagic disease of deer and African horse sickness. I mean, you should, you should kind of have, this is caused by an Orbi virus, and you should, you should have, uh, have those things kind of down and know what different diseases are caused by the same type agents, because they may, may wing those on you once in a while, too. Oops. Okay, I'm going to show you one more uh, bovine mouth and basically say, hey, this could be any one of the above. It could be BVD, blue tongue. Um, render pest, uh, malignant catarrhal fever, could be uremia, can't really tell. Now, this one happens to be a mycotic stomatitis caused by aspergillus. But I couldn't tell that by looking at it. Just put it on there to say, hey, I can't tell what it is. Okay, we're going to go a little further down the GI tract. And of course, everybody recognizes the honeycomb of the reticulum. And of course, we have traumatic reticulitis, hardware disease. Very common in cattle. Sometimes when animals have, have lesions like that, if they pers persist and cause a chronic irritation, what you get is fibrotic nodules in the reticulum. Those things are not uncommon. They try to wall this, this uh, foreign agent off. Um, one of the things I want to caution you on is just because you find hardware disease, don't all of a sudden say, well, that's what, what the problem with the reticulum is and go on something else. Because I've seen cases where we've had lymphomas and other problems associated with the reticulum, and we've had hardware at the same time. So, so, so on boards and otherwise, don't find the main lesion and quit. Continue to look on, because sometimes there's two or three things going on. Okay, this is just a, a typical 
uh, lesion uh, with hardware. Sometimes this is, this is actually going through from the heart, the pericardial sac, and this was into the abdominal cavity. And that's basically what they look like. Cause major problems. Initially, you get lesions like this. This happens to be the heart or what's left of it. And it's going down through, through the pericardial sac, through the diaphragm. And this is a, a, probably a subacute to chronic pericarditis. And of course, sometimes the animals, I don't know how they live this long, but you get the old, the typical or the classic shaggy heart. And I don't know how an animal can continue to function with, with a pericardial sac that's fibrotic and, and uh, with a chronic inflammatory process like that. I'm sure you'd have to find major ascites and, and hepatic and pulmonary problems associated with that. So the old shaggy heart. Okay, um, looking at the, the rumen. And basically, we're going to get into rumen ulcers. And that's what we have here. And there are a couple different things that cause rumen ulcers, or a couple main ones we want to talk about. More of the same type thing, rumen ulcers. Very common. Um, most common in feedlot cattle. Okay. Um, basically, what happens is, is uh, animals on feedlots, or animals that are displaced on feedlots, oftentimes are put on, on high, high carbohydrate or high grain diets. And these animals, all of a sudden, they're put on a high carbohydrate diet. They eat it, their GI tract flora is not used to, to taking in all this, this carbohydrate. It changes the GI tract flora. This grain also ferments and produces or develops into, uh, produces lactic acid. And you get a lactic acidosis of the rumen. Well, if you take lactic acid and put it on your hand or on your skin, you're going to get a chemical burn. Well, that's exactly what happens in the rumen. You get a chemical burn to the, to the mucosa, sloughs off the epithelium, allows anything in the rumen to get down into the, the underlying tissues. And of course, there are certain organisms, a variety of organisms that are common and, and uh, normal in the bovine ruma, rumen, one of which is Fusobacterium necrophorum. Necrobacillosis agent is, is normal in the bovine rumen. This organism goes through these rumen ulcers, gets in the bloodstream, goes through the portal system to the liver, causes liver abscesses. That's the pathogenesis they'd be looking for if they ask you a pathogenesis on necrobacillosis or liver abscesses in bovine liver. So these are these are abscesses that are or these are ulcers that are secondary to to grain overload and lactic acidosis. <coughs> Same thing right here. This is an abscess that's healing over. Whole whole series of abscesses here that are healing. Secondary to grain overload. Um, other things cause ulcers in the GI tract. This happens to be the omasum. We have a, a very large ulcer here that's kind of red, especially along the outer surface here. Fairly characteristic of this condition. Red along the outer surface with an ulcer. Again, this is the omasum. You start seeing lesions like this, the first thing that better come to your mind is mycotic. These are, these are characteristic of mycotic when you have the pale center and the round rim around the outer surface or outside. And I don't know what caused these. I think it's probably associated with these organisms usually get into the bloodstream. They cause vascular thrombosis with maybe a hemorrhagic infarct. In cattle, it's probably more common to find zygomycotic agents than aspergillus in these. I find them very common in, in swine, too. This happens to, to again, be a lesion of, of uh, zygomycosis, a mycotic lesion. Um, this one happens to be, I believe that was in the, in the abomasum, mycotic abomasitis. Same thing here. Notice, again, these are typical. You start seeing lesions like this on boards. If you don't call that a mycotic something, you've lost. You've got to, the first, first rule, it has to be mycotic. Very typical of, of fungal lesions in the GI tract. Okay, um, looking at an abomasum, happens to be about a six month old animal. If that's in focus back there or not, but you, if you notice it's kind of lumpy and bumpy. If you really cut into that, and the people in the front can maybe see, there looks like there's almost emphysema or air in there. And yes, there is. So you start seeing an abomasum that has emphysema or air in it. There's only one thing that I know really that, that's the most common cause of that. They ask you for a disease, you better tell them Braxy. They ask you for an agent, it's Clostridium septicum. It's not common in cattle, but it does occur. Braxy. Anytime you have emphysema, and histologically, you'd look at that, you'd find these great big pockets of emphysema. That was on histopath boards about four years ago. Beautiful case of Braxy. Great big uh, emphysematous lesions in the abomasum. Okay, this happens to be an abomasum again with emphysema. And I don't know what caused this one. This may have been Braxy again. I don't know. But that's just a typical, it's an emphysematous abomasum. And I don't know what the cause was. 
This could have been Braxy. Okay, this happens to be an aval mesum, and you have a fairly sharp demarcation where you go from, from normal appearing tissue to actually what appears to be infarcted or hemorrhagic tissue, necrotic tissue over here. And you start seeing things like this where you have the sharp demarcation in a bovine aval mesum. I'll show you another slide, same thing. This is the old mesum over here, aval mesum here, sharp demarcation. If they ask you for, for the cause of that, you better be thinking about something like a, a displaced aval mesum. And that's what this was. This was a right displaced aval mesum with, a, with an infarction secondary to, to constriction of the blood vessels. DA. Okay, um, aval mesum of a cow. Lesions are, as far as I'm concerned, are, are pathic mnemonic. You start seeing things like this, these little round areas, raised and round in the aval mesum. Show you another one. Some of these lesions down here, sometimes you get more hemorrhagic areas and the more acute lesions, but you start getting the lumpy, bumpy surface of the, of the aval mesum. Same thing right here. All these things, you better be thinking parasitic. And the parasite you're thinking of is Ostertagia, Ostertagia. And basically what happens is nematode gets into, into uh, the glands or the, the, of the aval mesum and gets down in there and it burrows in there and it, and it stimulates hyperplasia of of non-functional epithelial cells, and these cells kind of replace the parietal cells and, and uh, pepsin-producing cells, and, and it raises the pH of the room or of the of the aval mesum, and sometimes these animals get diarrhea. But these are these are very typical of of ostertagiasis. Okay, um, bovine liver, gallbladder extensive, gallbladder edema, edema of the capsule of the liver. Just looking at that, I couldn't tell what that was. You have an extensive edema up through this area, too. Basically, this was, was a Salmonella Dublin infection. But you couldn't make that diagnosis from that. But also, you'd probably find GI tract lesions, and that, that's what we have here. This is an acute salmonellosis with hemorrhage. Sometimes you get erosions and ulcerations. Oftentimes, you do not find hemorrhage with Salmonella. These are more typical of some of your Salmonella lesions, where you actually get a, a pseudomembrane forming along the mucosal surface. That happened to be Salmonella typhromerium. This is a Salmonella, too. I don't know which one that was. Again, you have a, a pseudomembrane and an erosion and ulceration along the mucosa right through there. Again, more of the same type thing with a pseudomembrane. If that were in a swine, your diagnosis would probably be swine dysentery. Okay, and, um, small intestine again. Just showed you three or four different salmonellas, and you'd probably be thinking salmonella on this one. But basically, this one was E. coli. So again, you can't look at something and say definitely that that's what it is. But you can give an idea or have a suggestion of what it would be. And on boards, they'd probably accept salmonella or, or E. coli. I would think salmonella, if, if I had this on boards, I'd call that salmonella before E. coli. OK, put this one on there. Uh, you're, all, you're all checking an animal, and, and you happen to notice this, this animal may be very thin. We're into Yoni's disease right now. And this is, this is basically put on to show diarrhea from Yoni's disease. And I put that on to, to make a point. The animal that's the thinnest and the most emaciated looking may not have any diarrhea. May, it may be normal looking, the diarrhea, and, and the animal may not be, uh, uh, maybe, maybe in awful shape. So there's no, no association often between the clinical signs and the, and the severity of the lesions. And this is your typical uh, Yoni's type uh, small intestine, where you get the thickened rugi or the thickened uh, uh, mucosal surface here. Usually in yonis, it's fairly regular like this. And of course, if you look at this histologically, you'd find macrophages full of acid fast organisms. Typical yonis. But there again, this happens to be the ileum. We know that by, by pyrus patches. And again, we find a thickening of, of the mucosal surface. And also, anytime you have yonis, you want to take and, and uh, look at some of the mesenteric lymph nodes as well as the lymphatics going to those lymph nodes. And it's not uncommon to find lymph, lymphangitis and find giant cells with, with uh, acid fast organisms in the, in the lymphatics in the, as well as in the lymph nodes. <clears throat> Yoni's disease also, you know, like I said, usually it causes a, a very uniform thickening of the mucosa, but sometimes it causes lesions like this. It almost looks like it has an exudate on it. But there again, it's just a very thickened area. And the other areas are, are not nearly as thickened as that is. And this, there again, this was a Yoni's again. And this was a Yoni's. 
you started seeing lesions like this, you're almost thinking maybe a lymphoma or a, ne or a neoplasm of some type. But it was yonis. And of course, yonis uh, causes lesions other than just in the GI tract. And anytime you have, anytime you're doing a postmortem on an animal and you start seeing lesions like this, and of course, we're looking at, at uh, one of the major vessels, and we have a lesion under the intima, subendothelial mineralization, subendothelial mineralization, cut through that would be very gritty. Anytime you're, you're posting an animal and you start seeing a mineralization like that, you should start thinking of any chronic wasting disease. And the number one that should come to your mind is Yoni's disease. Or things like tuberculosis are way down the line. But, but anytime you start seeing mineralization in the major vessels, start thinking about the possibility of Yoni's disease and go, go for the GI tract. More of the same type of thing. I don't know what vessel this is, but this is a Yoni's mineralization, subendable mineralization. It doesn't even look mineralized to me. That's Yoni's. I, I don't know. Like I said, any chronic wasting disease can cause that, and I'm not sure what the, what the pathogenesis is of that, uh, whether there's a disturbance of calcium phosphorus metabolism, or I really don't know what it is. Anybody has any suggestions? I'd, I'd feel those questions, too. That could, that could be. Everybody hear that? So that the macrophages that are coming in and engulfing these, these uh, bacteria may help in the metabolism of, of 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol. So that's, that's as good a possibility or a good suggestion as I've heard. Oh. Okay, uh, this heart was from an animal that had Yonis too, and this is a large infarct. And this was supposedly associated with the vascular lesions with secondary thrombosis. So infarcts, you know, do do occasionally occur in cattle, and sometimes you find things like that. Try to try to try to go back and, and uh, see if you can actually find the true etiology and pathogenesis. Okay, we're looking again at one of the major vessels, and we have subendothelial mineralization. And, you know, like I said, the first thing you want to think about is yonis or any chronic wasting disease. But if, if it's not that, on the boards you're going to say, what else can it be? And you better be thinking about at least two other ones. First one would be maybe uremia, uremic mineralization. Second one would be vitamin D toxicity. Um, third one may be things like, like uh, plants that have vitamin D analogs, cistrum diurnum, and some of those other things that, that cause that. And, of course, you know, sometimes you get the, the perineoplastic syndrome where you get mineralization secondary to lymphoma and some of your other, you know, the other neoplasms. So there's a variety of different things that cause mineralization like that. This is a, the small intestines from a calf. And basically, this, one, this animal had a math, massive uh, atherosclerosis. And I have no idea why, what, what the pathogenesis was, what initiated this lesion. But it's just one of those things I'd never seen before. And, and uh, I assume most of you probably haven't seen it either. Atherosclerosis. Okay, as we're talking about the GI tract, I just want to throw one other thing in here. Here, of course, is a small intestine. And I put this on to a good time to cover fat necrosis. You know, most people think fat necrosis, no big shakes, no problem. The animal just has it and, and doesn't cause any problems at all. And as a rule, that's true. Unless it's in the pelvic cavity, sometimes after secondary to a dystocia, where it can cause major problems for, for the second time. Or if it's around one of the important organs, like you find here. And of course, you get fat necrosis here, it can constrict down and, and actually impede and, and cause an obstruction of, of the small intestine or any other tubular organ. And here again, this was the intestine with an area of fat necrosis along the periphery. And of course, you can find it in many other areas, and this happens to be around the kidney. And you know, around one kidney may not be a major problem. Around two kidneys, you get, you get all kinds of problems with uremia. And that's what happened with this animal. We had fat necrosis around this kidney, and we had a secondary hydronephrosis. So fat necrosis can cause major problems, and it depends upon where, where it is. Um, what's, the, what's the pathogenesis of fat necrosis? Well, sometimes it's traumatic, and sometimes it's associated with, uh, uh, with fescue foot type toxicosis. And, and a little later, I'll talk about that. <clears throat> okay, another GI tract lesion. Um, looking at uh, the small intestine from a cow, you start seeing a lesion like this, or 100 lesions like this. And it looks kind of nodular to me, so the first thing that goes to my mind is nodular worm disease, right? 
esophagostomiasis, and that's what it is. That's what some of your acute lesions look like. Esophagostomiasis, same thing here. Usually you see them through the serosal surface, you find these nodular lesions. If you cut into them, oftentimes they're mineralized and hard, full of exudate. Again, esophagostomiasis. Much more of a problem in sheep than it is in, in cattle. Esophagostomum radiatum, I think, is uh, the species name. And this is what the organisms look like, the adults. And with, with esophagostomiasis, it, basically what happens is the, the animal, the bovine, gets exposed to it. The organisms go into the GI tract. The larvae migrate through the, through the mucosa, into the submucosa, where they set up shop and develop, and they, they produce an inflammatory response, which is what, what you see, basically, which are eosinophilic granulomas, eosinophilic and mineralized granulomas. And they cause this irritation. And then after they're in that period, uh, they go through a series of molts, and then they migrate back out into the intestinal lumen. And there's when they cause the most problem. Um, these organisms, they do not, they do not uh, attach to the intestine. They don't suck blood. Basically what they do is they produce some kind of a compound that, that causes the animals to increase the secretion of mucus as well as inflammatory exudate into the stomach or into the, into the small intestine. And the animals somehow uh, live off of this mucus and this exudate that they've caused the animal to excrete. And of course, they can cause diarrhea. So esophagostomiasis. Uh-huh. Just one, more, one or two more slides. You want to take one? Um, just again, show the adults. Uh, Benadini usually don't cause much of a problem. They're just there, and sometimes you come across them. Okay, we also have uh, other parasites of the bovine. This, these happen to be rumen flukes. Panoplostephala, I think. I've, I've Paranostoma. Paranostoma. That's what they look like. Usually they don't cause much of a problem either. Half, of, half inch uh, in size or smaller. Just an incidental finding at times. Um, put this on just to remind me that, that uh, cattle get cryptosporidiosis. And about a year or a year and a half ago, they had a major problem in uh, northwest Georgia where, where uh, several thousand people got diarrhea secondary to drinking uh, water from a public system that was contaminated with uh, cryptosporidia that came from a calf, o calf operation. So cryptosporidia in cattle does infect humans. Usually you see very little problems with cryptosporidia. They can get some diarrhea, but uh, usually it's kind of a passing type thing and it doesn't kill the animals. Okay, other parasites of cattle. Um, you got an animal, usually an animal of six months to a year of age. He's standing out in the pen, usually a feedlot animal oftentimes. And he's straining, he's got blood on his tail and blood on his perineum. Diagnosis, sometimes you, you may find a rectal prolapse you start seeing that in a young animal, coccidiosis has got to be your answer. Not aware of anything else that causes those kind of clinical signs. Um, most animals do not develop the bloody diarrhea. They may strain a little bit. Uh, animals usually have coccidiosis for a short period of time. They uh, cure, cure themselves of it and never get it again. So coccidiosis is, is not that much of a problem. Here again, this happens to be the rectum of an animal with coccidiosis. And we have uh, melana hemorrhagic uh, diarrhea, and uh, there again, it's, it's not that big a problem in most, in most uh, feedlots. And of course, I put this on just to show that, that cattle, yes, indeed, do get trichobezoars, and sometimes you'll find 10 or 15 very large ones in the large intestine, usually. So that can be pretty good size. Another condition that, that we see once in a great while, and usually see it uh, and during post-mortem, it has been occasionally seen going through slaughter, but most of these animals are pretty sick. This is a cecal torsion. They get toxic in a hurry with those. Okay, go on to uh, the urinary system. Um, bovine kidney. Start seeing lesions like this. First thing you ought to think about is some kind of embolic shower. These are usually usually an embolic type situation. This one happened to be due to E. coli, and the animal had a severe metritis. So we think it probably came from a metritis. But that's the kind of appearance they get. Usually you see them in the cortex like that. Another embolic shower with a... Uh, Embolic nephritis, and uh, this one happened to be happened to be secondary to uh, bacterial endocarditis. Typical type of lesion. <clears throat> Sometimes you find lesions like this, and like I said, you start seeing the, the randomly distributed lesions like that. You need to think of some kind of a bacteremia, and this is a 
typical of an early lesion, early lesion of a white spotted kidney, which is caused by E. coli bacteremia. Very common in younger animals. Little older animals, they may look like this. A lot of times they're lumpy, bumpy. This is kind of a poor slide, but that's what they look like sometimes in older animals. Or they may look like this. It's a white spotted kidney. Now, if I'm on the, on the meat crasser room and doing a post-mortem or something, that's malignant lymphoma first and white spotted kidney second. There's no way I can, I can call that white spotted kidney. I may be able to, to cut into it and feel that there's a, there's a little more uh, collagenous feel to it rather than with a lymphoma. A lot of times you get the real soft look. But on boards, that's got to be lymphoma first and white spotted sick kidney would have to be down the line. This was a white spotted kidney. And here's a close-up shot just showing that. And, and there again, and in my book, that's a lymphoma. Um, this just happens to be a large kidney. This is a chronic interstitial nephritis. Notice how lumpy and bumpy it is. Um, cattle have a lot of problems with their kidneys. They get a lot of pyelonephritis, a lot of chronic interstitial nephritis. Um, a lot of times you look at bovine kidneys and you'll, you'll find very little parenchyma left and the animal is apparently doing fine. So they, they apparently uh, do very well become, before becoming uremic. But they have major kidney problems. This is a kidney again with a pyelonephritis caused by Cranibacterium renale, common condition in, in uh, cattle, pyelonephritis. This again is a pyelonephritis caused by Cranibacterium renale. Looks almost like we had a hydronephrosis associated with it. But you can see that the calyces are markedly dilated, Cranibacterium renale. This is an excellent board slide to put that on for you, and they may say, uh, give uh, three or four different things that could be. Give me four different things that can cause discoloration of the kidney. And you're going to be thinking about things. This happens to be lipofusinosis. But this could be bile, could be hemoglobin, could be myoglobin. Anything else that it could be? I think those would be the four that I'd want to list. But this happens to be lipofusinosis. Very fair board question. Wear and tear pigment. Okay, um, cystic kidneys are very common in cattle. And usually they're there and there are no big shakes and the animal doesn't, doesn't have any adverse side effects from them. So we see them very commonly. Sometimes you'll actually find the, the cyst rupture and you have urine in the, around the kidney, perikascular space. Um, another kidney, this kind of looks like the one I showed you a few minutes ago of chronic interstitial nephritis. It's large. This kidney was about twice the normal size. I'm sorry I don't have a ruler on there. But it has a little different look than that chronic interstitial nephritis. When you cut it, it looks like this. That's diagnostic. It's amyloidosis. Amyloidosis, usually they say it has a, the lardiferous look, a kind of glistening look to it. Classic for amyloidosis. Now, in bovine amyloidosis, uh, we see a couple different types of amyloidosis. You know, most amyloidosis in many species, you end up having the, the glomerular amyloidosis. But I would say, in my experience, I've probably seen at least as much amyloidosis in the medulla. And actually, you can start seeing some, some necrosis, secondary to amyloidosis. So anytime you start seeing bovine amyloidosis, look at the, at the medulla. Look at the, uh, it's fairly common to find amyloidosis in the liver, the adrenal gland. You find it in the lymph nodes. It's widespread throughout cattle. Amyloidosis. Um, kidney opened up. Probably be asked for a morphologic diagnosis and etiology and a pathogenesis on this one on boards. Very fair question. First one you probably want to say would be something like uh, hemoglobinuric nephrosis. Once you know that, then it opens up your other possibilities. What causes that? Well, the first thing you'd probably think of would be leptospirosis. That's what this was. But you'd also be thinking about other things like uh, bacillary hemoglobinuria, which causes the release of hemoglobin, hemoglobin stay in the kidney like this. And, but this happened to be leptospirosis. And of course, the pathogenesis of, of acute leptospirosis is basically intravascular hemolysis of red blood cells releasing hemoglobin, causing uh, hemoglobin nephrosis, hemoglobinuria and, and nephrosis like this. And of course, this is normal bovine urine, and this is the, the so-called port wine urine. And you, there again, you'd find that with acute lepto or with bacillary hemoglobinuria. And of course, you may be able to find something like that with myoglobinuria. So I can't just tell every time I see a, a dark kidney like that, I couldn't tell it was hemoglobinuria. And of course, also with the last, with the last slide back here, you start seeing things like this, you need to be thinking about, about some of your other problems. If that was a horse, you'd be thinking of red maple. 
Sometimes with, with oak toxicosis in, in cattle, you can start getting a, a hemoglobinuric necrosis. Okay, um, when you start seeing nephrosis with hemoglobin like we just saw, you know, initially you get a, a massive red kidney. And then as the animal survives, you start seeing lesions like this. Instead of being red, it turns kind of dark, and, and you actually start having these small, darker blotches. And if we went back and looked at this animal a week or two or a month later, you'd probably find that these dark blotches were gone, and the kidney would, would return pretty much to normal. So you, you, you see the different stages that the animals live through the acute uh, septicemic condition. That, had, that was secondary to leptospirosis again. Okay, uh, this kidney has a condition that, that we very rarely see now, if we see at all. And you start seeing almost rays of, of this light material extending down into the medulla from the cortex. And histologically, if you looked at that, you'd find aggregates of material in the proximal tubules. And basically what this is, this, this is uh, sulfur nephrosis. Nephrosis due to, the, to uh, sulfonamides. And this used to be a big problem back 20 or 30 years ago when they had sulfas that were very insoluble. But with the newer sulfas now, they're much more soluble, and, and you have less problem associated with, uh, with precipitation out in the kidney like this. So that's uh, sulfa nephrosis. Okay, this looks very similar to sulfonephrosis, right? And I couldn't tell the difference by looking at that. Um, again, we have the, an accumulation of this material. It seems to radiate down. Uh, this is more of a problem in the cortex. It doesn't seem to be that much of a problem in the medulla. And this is oxalate nephrosis. And where do they get oxalates from? Of course, you know, you think of ethylene glycol, but that's not what this one is. Um, usually, oxalates are associated with plants like uh, greasewood, halogenin, sarcobatis, rhubarb, there's a whole series of plants that have high oxalate concentrations. And basically what happens is, is oxalate uh, becomes bound with calcium. You get a precipitation of calcium oxalate crystals in the proximal tubules. And sometimes you get a mechanical obstruction. Or you may end up, uh, because the oxalates bind calcium, you may end up with a hypocalcemic situation where the animals uh, are hypocalcemic calcemic, and they have problems with oxidative phosphorylation. So you end up having a, a mechanical nephrosis as well as a, a nephrosis secondary to energy problems. So due to calcium oxalates. OK, uh, got a uh, kidney here. You find we have extensive fat necrosis in the medulla. And we also have areas of nephrosis. Kind of hard to see on this with a dark kidney. But, but if you look at it real closely, you start seeing some pale yellow areas, which are areas of acute nephrosis. And also, we, in that kidney, if you look at it histologically, you'd start finding some, some granulomas in there with multinucleated giant cells, macrophages, neutrophils, and, and a few lymphocytes and plasma cells. Same animal you start seeing, you, you find hemorrhage of the, of the heart. You may find streaking. You may find uh, degenerative myopathy of the heart. And you also go out and you, and you look at the animal, and the animal's down. He has alopecia with dermatitis. Start seeing kidney lesions, heart lesions, and dermatitis. You should start thinking about hairy vetch toxicity. Because of the granulomatous uh, nephritis, granulomatous and degenerative uh, hepatitis, or uh, myocarditis, and the dermatitis like this. Hairy vetch is a, is a fairly big problem down in the southeast. Classic lesion when you start seeing, histologically, this is an excellent lesion to look at for boards. And you know, the two things you want to consider when you start seeing a granulomatous uh, nephritis would be tuberculosis and hairy, hairy vetch toxicity. Two things you want to think of. <clears throat> Put this uh, slide on here just to, to make a point. You've got an animal that's down. And whenever you, you start seeing animals having CNS signs, you should go through your six or eight different conditions that cause CNS signs in cattle, which are thromboembolic meningoencephalitis and polio and rabies. And, and lead and uh, you know, certain things like lymphoma. And I'm sure there are two or three other ones I haven't, have, don't have the, have the tip of my tongue right now. But uh, this animal was down, was paddling, and was blind. You start seeing this, you know, first thing that pops in your mind is lead poisoning. And that's what this one was. I couldn't tell just by looking at that 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 was. But when you open up the rumen, you find lead shavings in there. So 
this was an acute lead poisoning. Usually you won't find those things. And I just put this on. This happens to be the kidney. And these are intranuclear inclusion bodies that you find with lead. Usually you can see them without staining, you know, just with a normal H&E stain. This is a very lightly stained slide. And if you put on an acid fast stain, you get lesions like this, intranuclear acid fast inclusion bodies, characteristic of lead. Okay, you've got an animal, you've got a herd of animals, and you've got several of them in there sick. And some of them are out there straining with, with bloody diarrhea, and other ones are out there constipated, may have rectal prolapse. Some of the animals are dying, they're, they're in bad shape. And you, you do a post on a couple animals, and you find a hemorrhagic enteritis. This one almost looks like it has an ulcer through the cirrhosis the surface of the intestine. And you may go in and find these animals that this one happened to have an ulcer along the tongue. Looks almost like an injury to me, but that was an ulcer associated with this condition. And we had ulcers of the esophagus. You start looking at the kidney, you find petechial hemorrhages. The kidney was large and swollen. A lot of times you find edema around the kidney. We're looking at oak toxicity or acorn toxicity. And there's a couple different syndromes associated with this or a couple different causes. First of all, the most severe problems occur in the spring of the year when, when, the, when the leaf buds are young and, and fairly plush. And uh, usually what happens, animals are turned loose and there may be a storm or something that knocks down these, these trees and the animals are, are hungry to start with. Maybe they're overcrowded and they, they eat a bunch of these leaves and end up having acute oak toxicity. Or the second syndrome, the second time they get the condition is in the fall of the year, uh, usually right after the first frost, while the, while the acorns are still green. Uh, the green acorns are toxic as well as the green leaves. So this happens to be oak toxicity due to, and the toxin is a, is a tannin. Oftentimes with oak toxicity, histologically you'll find, a, again, you'll find a tubular nephrosis, usually in the proximal convoluted tubules, and you'll find a, a large quantity of protein in the tubules as well as sometimes you'll find bile and, and hemoglobin. So you can get a bile or hemoglobin nephrosis secondary to oak toxicity. And this just happens to be a little more chronic one. You find petechial hemorrhages in there secondary to oak toxicity. It's more of the same. This is the off color here. You know, when you start seeing off colors like that, you probably think, well, if this was just, you didn't have the hemorrhage in that associated with this, you'd probably be thinking about a, a lipidosis or a lymphoma or something like that. We you start seeing hemorrhage in here and the off color like that should make you think about some kind of a nephrosis. There again, that's oak toxicity. And of course, sometimes you can find perirenal hemorrhage and edema with, uh, with oak. Okay, any, any questions about oak? That's more of a problem there again up in New York and the Northeast and, and the North Central states. I don't really know whether, uh, what's causing that. I, I haven't seen anything on it either. Anybody have any, any suggestions what that could be? Um, just put this on here as kind of a, of a gee whiz type lesion. You know, cattle get a number of, of renal stones, and that's what we have here. And they get a variety of different things. And, and these stones are about the about size of, of small kernels of corn. This is a very high power shot. And of course, you know, in, in the steers and the bulls, they can cause major problems. This happens to be the urinary bladder opened up. And there are stones in the urinary bladder. It's kind of hard to see from maybe where some of you folks are. That one, I think, is just a shadow. But these are stones in there. And of course, you get a chronic cystitis, almost a, a polypoid proliferation of some of the areas of the, of the urinary bladder. And sometimes you get stones in there, and they can continue to, to, uh, to be moved around and cause a chronic irritation. And that's what we have here: is uh, ulcers and, and hemorrhage secondary to, to chronic or chronic cystitis secondary to stone accumulation. Another urinary bladder, and we find areas of hemorrhage and hyperemia. Maybe sometimes you find ulcers in there. Um, that's an excellent board slide too. You know, give me two or three different things that can cause lesions like this. First one would be there again kidney or uh, urinary stones in our calculi. Um, something else that can cause something like this, and what this is, this is septicemia secondary to Haemophilus somnus. Haemophilus somnus causes things other than than thromboembolic meningoencephalitis. It causes pneumonias and uh, I think sometimes you can get arthritis from homophilus somnus, so it can cause a, a variety of different things. Another thing you'd want to consider here, and I would put this fairly high in my list, would be something like an enzoatic hematuria. 
caused by bracken fern. And what other thing, what other thing than uh, hematuria is associated with bracken fern in the urinary bladder? It's a carcinogen. And you can develop a series of different tumors, which include things like transitional cell carcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas. So uh, enzoatic hematuria caused by bracken fern. So there's a variety of things that cause lesions like this. And of course, if that was a horse, you'd be thinking about what? Blister beetle? Okay, uh, bovine placenta. In our last lecture, we went over these things. These are normal epithelial plaques. On boards, you, people get all kinds of variety of different answers when they see those things, but those are normal things in the, in the, plas in the placenta of the bovine. Same thing right here, normal epithelial plaques. You know, people see those on the boards and they freak out and they, they call that aspergillosis and, and uh, you need to know what your normal structures are. That's aspergillosis. It's placentitis from, from aspergilla, mycotic placentitis. Or bovine uterus, adventitial placentation. I'd, have a, I'd be hard pressed not to, to call that an adenocarcinoma. But one of the things about bovine adenocarcinomas is usually they don't grow out like this. Oftentimes they grow in. And also if you cut into bovine adenocarcinomas, it's one of the most scariest tumors you'll find. Usually there's a lot of connective tissue associated with it, and, and this right here would, would cut like epithelial tissue, not like, like uh, scar tissue. Adventitial placentation. Okay, uh, uterus that's opened up. Everybody's going to say, well, look at that metritis, right? Well, that's not. That is normal lochia. And this is about 30 days postpartum. So you need to, to know about certain things that, that can be normal. going on here? Mummified fetus. And this just showing a macerated fetus with the bones in here. Remainder of the fetus here. Okay, uh, you open up this bovine uterus and you look in there and, and uh, you get a widespread uh, accumulation of this, this uh, material, this exudate. Doesn't smell looks like caramel candy, or caramel has a caramel type appearance. This is characteristic of brucellosis, brucella abortus. No smell, looks like caramel. And of course this slide, I don't know where this one even came from, but this, this slide is probably over in, older than the hills, but, but this happens to be uh, brucellosis in a bull with an orchitis here. And of course everybody knows that, that strain T19 produces brucella in bulls, right? So you don't you don't vaccinate bulls with with uh, strain T19. I don't I don't know if I've never seen that in, in real life. Has anybody here ever seen that condition? Be of historical importance, I guess. <coughs> Section here. This is a bovine penis, and this is is a penile hematoma from a from a rupture from a trauma traumatic hematoma. Sometimes they get kicked, or sometimes they mount and fall off, or whatever, and, and cause lesions like this. Okay, you're looking at the abdominal cavity of a, of a carcass hanging, feet are up this way. You start seeing lesions like this, and this is in the retroperitoneal area. A bull, used to be a bull. This is post castration hemorrhage, retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Be surprised how many animals die of this. Some, you know, some some vet goes out, or some of the Farmers go out and they do a castration and they don't know what they're doing and, and it's surprising how many animals will die and if you open them up they have that lesion. <clears throat> Bovine mammary gland, lesions like this look almost like sulfur granules and that's kind of what they are. This is botryomycosis mycosis caused by Staph aureus. Not a common condition to find it like this in a bovine udder. Nasal cavity of a cow. Let me show you another one here. Cavity's opened up. You look in the into. This is the septum, okay? Mid midline septum. Nasal cavity of a cow. Probably ask you for a diagnosis and a histologic appearance. Maybe pathogenesis on this one. First of all, you need to recognize it as a nasal granuloma. 
And once you've done that, then, then what's the histologic appearance of it? Connective tissue, eosinophils, a few macrophages, a few neutrophils. Some giant cells. Sometimes the giant cells have something in them, right? They have fungal organisms in them, helminthal sporum. But we don't know whether that causes this condition in cattle or not. That may just be an opportunistic infection, an opportunistic fungi that gets in there, but it's fairly common to find it. But with the, with the number of eosinophils in there, the reaction is, is characteristic of a hypersensitivity of some type. And it may be these organisms or it may be something else. But anyhow, uh, nasal granulomas are some type of a hypersensitivity. Of course, you'd want to be thinking about some kind of tumor, too. Okay, this uh, slide uh, showing calf diphtheria. Looking at the larynx of a, of a calf caused by Fusobacterium necrophorum. Usually it doesn't have this color to it. I don't know why it's kind of green. It looks almost like a, a Zootomonas type organism or something. But that was Fusobacterium necrophorum. Typical location for calf diphtheria. Same thing here, calf diphtheria. Another one with calf diphtheria. Good board question. There's an article in Vet Path a few years ago. What, what lesion often occurs secondary to calf diphtheria? Right in this area. What's often secondary to it right there in that area? Very common to find papillomas in this area, secondary to calf diphtheria, or secondary to any lesion in this, in this region. And calf diphtheria you know, can cause lesions a little lower in the respiratory tract. Usually it doesn't cause respiratory problems other than, than in the upper respiratory tract. It doesn't cause pneumonias, but sometimes you can get a tracheitis with froth and, and hemorrhage and, and exudate. And also with Fusobacterium necrophorum, like I said, you can get that organism any place in the carcass. And this happens to be a, a lesion caused by Fusobacterium necrophorum in the posterior aspect of the mouth. So, like I said, Fusobacterium is a is a, a pathogenic organism for cattle and causes a lot of problem and a lot of economic loss in addition to to condemn or uh, to condemn livers. <coughs> Start seeing lesion like this in a cow and uh, you should already be thinking about what the diagnosis could be. You have a conjunctivitis and a rhinitis. Same thing here. This slide is older than the hills too and that's characteristic and classic of this disease condition. If I was going to put one on boards, I'd probably put this one on. If I wouldn't ask you what the condition was, I'd ask you something about it. Conjunctivitis, rhinitis. This is malignant catarrhal fever, which does occur in the United States. It's not common, but it does occur. The cause in Africa has been, they've isolated a herpes virus, but in the United States, as far as I know, they still have not been able to isolate that virus, so the cause is is supposed to some type of a virus, malignant catarrhal fever. Those are the, the classic ocular lesions. Again, malignant catarrhal fever. Looks like that blue tongue I showed, or it could be a BVD, render pest, a variety of things could cause lesions like that. Here you got a hemorrhagic and necrotizing rhinitis from MCF. If I saw that alone, I'd be thinking about red nose with IBR. That's MCF. Hemorrhagic tracheitis. Again, that looks like IBR. I'm going to show you one in a little while. This IBR looks the same thing like this. Looking at the hard palate with ulcers and erosions. Look at catarrhal fever. Abomasum. Remember in, in BVD and in, in Renderpest, I showed you lesions with hemorrhagic areas like this in the abomasum. Well, this is malignant catarrhal fever. So a variety of things cause, a variety of, of septicemias cause lesions that look very similar. And of course, you can get lesions in the skin, lesions in the feet. You can get a coronitis here with the coronary band, again with a sloughing of the foot once in a while. You can get lesions, erosions and ulcerations along the teats or along the vulva. If, I, if I'm going to give this on boards, you know, I, I may even tell you that it was malignant catarrhal fever. And one of my questions is going to be, uh, what's the histologic, what's the character, classic or characteristic histologic diagnostic feature of this condition? Anybody know what, what it would be? A what now? Right. What kind of vasculitis? Yeah, fibrinoid necrosis, and you get the accumulation of mononuclear cells. And that is, is characteristic of MCF. 
But that's, that, there again, that's a, a typical board type question. You, you could expect to find. I think that's fairly fair. But oftentimes, if they do give you that, they may kind of tell you what the disease is, or at least give you an indication or something that's, that's totally diagnostic before they get into that. Okay, uh, looking at the nasal cavity of a cow. Diagnosis. That was if that was on your loaf of bread at home, you wouldn't have any trouble with it. Aspergillosis. Mycotic rhinitis. Same thing right here. Tracheitis. Kind of gets that that white mycelial type look to it. I'm not, I'm not aware of anything else that looks like that. And of course, if you had that in your hands, you wouldn't have any trouble you know, looking at it very closely and picking out that as those as being uh, fungal hyphae. Aspergillosis. A few years ago, I was up in, in a large slaughterhouse in Pennsylvania, and a cow came through, and, and the lung fields were chuck full of hemorrhagic areas like this. Random, randomly distributed hundreds of hemorrhagic areas throughout the entire parenchyma. And of course, they had some emphysema and a few other things going on. And I'd never seen anything like that before, and took a further look at the cow and started seeing lesions like this on the liver. These, of course, uh, you know, some of these areas may be telangiectasis, but I can't tell. We had, er had areas like this that went through the surface of the liver, down in the parenchyma, and it's kind of light in here, but hopefully, hopefully you can see these, these dark areas of, of hemorrhage and necrosis. And when we took these back and did histopath on them, both the lung lesions and the liver were chuck full of aspergilla. And this, this liver also had extensive amyloidosis. But I've never seen a, a, a set of lungs that looked like that before. So anytime you start seeing hemorrhagic lesions like that, you know, mycotic lesions do produce areas of hemorrhage. And they should go towards the top of your differential list. <coughs> Sometimes when you do have fungal granulomas, if the animal lives through it, they heal and you get lesions like this. And these are old, old fungal granulomas in the lungs of the cow. Okay, uh, bovine respiratory system is susceptible to a wide variety of different organisms. And of course, you have the shifting fever complex, and there are numerous things that are associated with that. And you know, if you're going to list, list agents, you'd probably come up with four or five in a hurry. Of course, one of which would be PI3 and Pasteurella and maybe mycoplasma. But this right here, this is an experimental case where the animal uh, was given bovine respiratory syncytial virus, which is a pneumovirus. And this is, this is the lesion that was caused by that virus alone. And basically what you have is just small areas of atelectasis. Atelectasis basically means lack of air. And there again, so it demonstrates that, that bovine respiratory syncytial virus alone can cause pulmonary lesions in cattle. OK, um, a little while ago, I showed you malignant catarrhal fever with a, with a necrotic rhinitis or hemorrhagic rhinitis. Same thing here, but this happens to be red nose, caused by, associated with uh, infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, which is an alpha herpes, herpes virus. Typical red nose. If you talk to any practitioners, that's one of the first things that comes up is red nose. Of course, you get lesions in the larynx, you get hemorrhage and necrosis. You can get an extensive necrohemorrhagic tracheitis, actually going on entire, through the wall of the trachea here. And sometimes when the animals live, which they usually do, you can start getting lesions like this in the more chronic cases where you actually have a, they get almost a, a pseudomembrane forming over the, the epithelial surface of the trachea. IBR. Usually with IBR, you do not find lower respiratory problems. Usually it causes more of the upper tracheal and above type lesions. And of course, there's another thing associated with that, with a herpes virus, a little different herpes virus, and that's bovine infectious pustular vulvovaginitis, which you get lesions like this. And you can also get lesions of the, of the prepuce in the bulls with this, which, like I said, this again is a herpes virus, a little different type of herpes than, than the one that causes IBR, the, the respiratory problems. I get around and, and put on a fair number of talks, and, and uh, one of the things that never you know, fails to, to amaze me is, is how few people know anything about pneumonias. I'm not talking specifically about this group, because I, I hope this group is very, very adept and up on what pneumonias are, how to differentiate them, how you tell bronchopneumonias from interstitial pneumonias, what, what can it be, and, and a list of different things. But, but going out and talking to the average veterinarian or veterinary student, even after they've gone through pathology courses, like in, in, in veterinary school, and most practitioners have very little concept of what pneumonias are. I mean, they, you can look at a set of lungs that looks like pneumonia to me, and maybe congestion or atelectasis or 
or whatever, but there's very little understanding of different pneumonias. And I think it's important that people can be able to look at a set of lungs and at least kind of put it in a certain category. You need to know your species, and then you need to know what diseases cause those type of lesions in that species. And I expect everybody in this, this room right now to be able to look at that and say, that's a bronchopneumonia. I mean, that's, this is typical of bronchopneumonia. You start finding it in the, in the front lower lobes of the lung. In any species, that's where you're going to find your bronchopneumonias. So you ought to be able to immediately go and, and come up with this kind of a, of a, of a diagnosis. Uh, start finding lesions throughout the whole lung parenchyma, then you better start thinking about some of your other interstitial type pneumonias. Bronchopneumonias, of course, got there through the respiratory system. Interstitial pneumonias more than likely got there through the, through the uh, hematogenous route. So this is a bronchopneumonia. This happens to be Pastorella hemolytica. Pastorella hemolytica is a, is a severe organism. It causes major problems in cattle. And usually it starts as a bronchopneumonia, but it can turn into a, to a lobar pneumonia. The organism is highly virulent. You get organisms that's, that or you get a pneumonia that starts around the smaller airways, and it can extend throughout the lobules. It can actually go across the interlobular septa and produce lobar pneumonias. In other words, it could start over here and actually progress right across through the parenchyma and become a lobar pneumonia. The more virulent the agent, the more chance it has of causing lobar pneumonias. And as, as you get lobar pneumonias, they become more severe. And of course, with, with pastorella type organisms, you have extensive accumulations of, of edema and fibra in the interlobular septa. Why, why, does, uh, why is bronchopneumonia a severe problem in cattle? What, what is different in cattle that, that is not found in any other species? And to answer that question, you need to know about the bovine lung. What's different about, about cow lungs that you don't find in many other, you don't find in dog lungs. And you need to know that, that uh, in the cow lung, each of the little lung lobules, the smallest thing where the, where the respiratory bronchial drains into a, into a lobule that has alveoli around it, each lobule is separated from every other lobule. And so when you get exudate that blocks that little airway, the bronchial, when you get exudate in there, there's no way to get air down below that exudate so the animal can cough it out. So when an animal becomes infected and gets a, a plug of mucus or pus in that airway, and you get, you get organisms in there that continue to proliferate, and the animal cannot clear that infection. Whereas in other species, there's a communication between adjacent lobules. So if you get a, a blockage of one of the small bronchioles, you can get air from other parts of the lung that can get down below and cough that plug out. It's highly important in knowing why pneumonias in cattle are, are, are severe type lesions, and they can't clear. Any questions on that? I don't know if I explained that well. But you need to know about the lobular structure of the bovine lung and that it is a, it's a, it's a, a closed balloon that can't get air in from other places. It can only get air in from the one place. Bronchopneumonia in cattle. Just another pastorella hemolytica type lesion, again showing the extensive accumulation of, of fibrin and edema in the interlobular septa. And of course, with, with uh, pastorella hemolytica and pastorella multasta, usually these things cause vascular damage. You get an extensive outpouring of, of fluid, fibrin, and you end up having a pleuritis, and that's what we have here. Again, that's fairly typical of your shipping, shipping on pneumonia, shipping fever complex. Okay, um, this is a board slide for you. I'd like you to look at that right there. You're looking at the, at the front ventral lobes of a, of a bovine lung, and you need to be able to give me a, a morphologic diagnosis on this. And you can even give a little pathogenesis on that. Basically, what I'd like you to be able to say is you can have a, a chronic bronchopneumonia, and that'll get you one point. But if you don't say with bronchiectasis, you've blown this slide. Because that is typical of bronchiectasis. When you start seeing the surface of a lung that has the, the lumpy, bumpy look that looks like the outer surface of a pineapple, that's bronchiectasis. And what is bronchiectasis? Bronchiectasis is dilated bronchi. What causes this? Well, most pneumonias in cattle start at the bronchial alveolar junction. And you get an exudate, you get an outpouring of, of neutrophils into that area, you get a proliferation of, of bacteria, you get a, an inflammatory response, and then the bacteria are there, the neutrophils and the macrophages come in and try to gobble up and destroy these, these bacteria. Um, these are, these uh, inflammatory cells degranulate. The proteins that are released by degranulation, they don't know what bacteria is from, from what epithelial cells are, and so they go in and they destroy everything. So you get an ongoing inflammatory process at this junction. And these, these things continue to grow until you get a large exudate there. 
this exudate continues to work on the wall of, of this airway and actually eventually eats through the airway and destroys If there's cartilage, if it's a little higher up in the lung and you have cartilage, it destroys the whole thing. So you actually get a big ball of pus. And that's what bronchiectasis is. And that's what you have right here. This is one of the larger airways that's full of pus. And there should be cartilaginous rings along the outer surface here. But the exudate here, the, the enzymes in that have destroyed the rings and actually have a big walled off abscess there. And that's the area of a bronchiectasis. This is one of the larger areas. And that's what it looks like when you, when you take the pus out of there. It's just a, a flaccid bag. And of course, the lung parenchyma around these, these areas of pus, the, the lung parenchyma, once you close off that airway, the air is absorbed from the alveoli. And so that when the air is absorbed, the lung collapses around there. So when you start seeing lesions of, of bronchiectasis, like lesions like this, each one of these is a little airway full of pus. And oftentimes, if you look around these areas, they're kind of red. You find little, little red, red circles around, and those are collapsed alveoli. And all you have is, is vessels full of blood. There's no air there. There's just, you have the, the alveolar walls full of blood. So that's what you see when you start seeing bronchiectasis. I don't know if that's clear at all or not. It usually takes about a half an hour to describe what's going on, but I think it's important to know what bronchiectasis is and, and how it gets there. Um, just put this one on for historical significance again. If you looked at this right here, it looks a lot like Pastorella pneumonia again. You have an extensive accumulation of fibrin and edema in the interlobular septa. And, you know, your first diagnosis would have to be, you know, Pastorella pneumonia. And this is put on there just to say that, that uh, contagious bovine pleural pneumonia causes a very similar lesions. You get, you get fibrin and edema in these areas, and also usually you get an extensive pleuritis. And that's caused by mycoplasma, mycoides, mycoides, small colony type. This is a foreign animal disease, which is supposedly not in our country. Contagious bovine pleural pneumonia. Another pneumonia here, um, this happens to be a calf. Head, head is up this direction. See lesions like this. Probably started as a bronchial pneumonia. Start seeing lesions like this, you better be thinking that's a lobar pneumonia. That's just extending from here and just, just spreading. Highly virulent organism. You're thinking pastorella. Well, this one happens to be Haemophilus somnus. Haemophilus somnus, like I said before, does cause things other than, than uh, CNS lesions. I showed you the urinary tract, the, the hemorrhage in the urinary bladder. And this is a Haemophilus somnus pneumonia. Okay, all the pneumonias that I've shown you so far have had lesions right here, right? Started seeing lesions like this, bingo, that's not bronchopneumonia. You tried to pick those lungs up, those things that weigh 50 or 75 pounds. They're just pure fluid. Name this condition? Acute bovine pulmonary edema and emphysema. That's a specific condition in cattle. It's an interstitial pneumonia. What what class of, of agents or uh, what, what class of agents cause interstitial pneumonias in cattle? In dogs, you'd probably say viruses. In cattle, you better say toxic plants or toxins. That's most of your interstitial pneumonias in cattle are caused by, by uh, some plant toxin. So what caused this type of pneumonia? Now I can name off three or four different ones. The first thing that probably go into my mind would be L-tryptophan and 3-methylindole. Animals are put out in, in the fall of the year on a lush pasture. They go in and they eat the, this, this lush pasture that's high in, high in L-tryptophan. goes in the room and the room and metabolizes L-tryptophan to a compound known as 3-methylindole. 3 3-methylindole 3 goes throughout the bloodstream. The target organ is the, is the lung. It goes in and, and causes vascular damage, leaks out, gets to the, to the type 1 pneumocytes. Type 1 pneumocytes are very susceptible to damage. 3-methylindole somehow destroys type 1 pneumocytes type 2 pneumocytes continue to live, and they proliferate. So initially, what happens is you get vascular damage, type 1 pneumocytes die, you get a massive outpouring of fluid into the lung. And that's basically what you see here, just, just full of fluid, full of emphysema and fluid. If the animal lives, the type 2 pneumocytes, the thick pneumocytes, proliferate, and they cover the, the entire alveolar surface. And if the animal continues to live, well, first of all, when, when you have these things, the lung becomes many times heavier than it normally is. Normally, a, a type 1 pneumocyte is very flat, whereas a type pneumocyte is, is many, many times thicker than a type 1 pneumocyte. But if the animal lives through this, and there hasn't been major structural damage to the lung, type, new, type 2 pneumocytes will convert to type 1 pneumocytes, and the animal can actually resolve much of this problem. So that's, that's atypical interstitial pneumonias. 
And uh, things like 3-methylindol cause this. Also, there's a compound known as perillo mint. There's, there's a 4 ipominol associated with uh, moldy sweet potatoes. It'll cause lesions similar to this. Um, there's, a, there's a variety of other things that cause interstitial pneumonias like this. But like I said, in cattle, you started seeing lesions like this throughout the entire lung frank, or in any species. Start thinking interstitial pneumonias. Start thinking it probably got there through the bloodstream. Now, in cattle, I mean, we could have a, a massive problem associated with an acute salmonella septicemia that would cause lesions, something like this. You wouldn't have the, the fluid in that in the acute lesion, but you have lesions like that. And here again, this is, this is a, a, probably a subacute lesion with emphysema, and there'd be massive amounts of edema in here. More of the same with congestion. And this is what the chronic lesion looks like. This is atypical interstitial pneumonia, fog fever, whatever you want to call it. If you looked at that lung, that thing, it just, you couldn't hardly pick that up. And that's, just, that's because there's such an accumulation of type 2 pneumocytes lining the airways. Sometimes uh, secondary to pneumonias, we also get things like mineralization. Basically, what we have here is, is pulmonary mi mineralization or ossification. Don't usually know what causes these things. They're just kind of things you once in a while you encounter. Looking through the pleural surface here, again, this is a, is a pulmonary ossification. And just one more to show the same thing. I don't know how the animal breathes with these lungs. You, you, you try to try to compress them or something. And you just or you, you try to cut a knife, take a knife cut through there, and, and you just destroy your knife with one cut. Pulmonary ossification. <clears throat> Put this one on. I really don't have any good slides of of lung worms, and I'm trying to show some lung worms here. This is an airway, and we have an accumulation of uh, Dictyocles, viviparous uh, lung worms in the bovine here. Usually when you start seeing lungworm lesions, you find them in the diaphragmatic lobes. A lot of times you'll find them along the surface where you have areas of emphysema. And these things, unless you're opening up the smaller airways, a lot of times you won't find them. You really got to be looking for lungworms to find them, unless they're, unless they're massive. Everybody still with me? Most folks have no understanding of pneumonias. <laughs> Continue on with some lesions that are probably of little importance, but you encounter them once in a while. And uh, we're just looking at a case of melanosis. Melanosis can occur any place in, in cattle, and just like in sheep. You find it in the lungs, in adrenal gland meninges, brain, a wide variety of different locations. Um, you show another lesion, pulmonary emphysema. A lot of times this is agonal. Sometimes in the ones that aren't agonal, you can actually get a rupture of some of these large bullae, and you'll get air that actually extends through the chest cavity into the subcutaneous tissue, and you can actually move your hand over the skin and feel the air subcutaneously. Set of the lungs, start seeing lesions like this, dark lesions in there, obviously a melanoma. Well, obviously not. This happens to be fluke migration. And it's not uncommon to find this dark fluke pigment, these fluke tracts in the lungs. You can find them any place. They can, they can go other parts of the carcass, too. But it's not uncommon to find them in the lungs. Um, just while I'm mentioning that, um, melanomas are not common in cattle. But almost every melanoma that I've seen in cattle has been malignant. So anytime you start seeing dark black lesions, think of flukes. And then if you can rule out flukes, think of melanosis, and the, then, then think of melanomas. Is the migration associated with vascular or through the parenchyma? Through the parenchyma. 
And I've even seen, like I said, you can, you can find fluke eggs, you can find mineral. A lot, of, a lot of times these lesions, they cause a lot of tissue damage in, like I said, in the lungs, in the, in the liver, in the hepatic lymph nodes. They cause a lot of damage, and usually if, if the lesion's a little older, you start finding mineral in there. Anytime you're cutting these lesions and you find mineral, fluke is way up there towards the top, and your other things would have to come after that. This slide is, is one of these 100-year-old slides, but it's the best one I have. And, you know, we find polycystic lung, right? Well, anytime you start finding polycystic anything in cattle, you know, other than kidney and liver, you better be thinking about parasites. And this happens to be caucus, hydatid disease. If you open these things up, you'd find all these little scoices on the inside there. And this is, this is another poor example of a slide, but it's the best one I have. And this is a bovine lung, animal from out west, had bone lesions and lung lesions. This happens to be coccidioides immatus. Usually causes lesions in the lymph node, sometimes in bone, sometimes in lung. And I would say that probably every two years, every two years coccidioides immatus is on the boards, his, on histopath, so be on, be on the outlook for it. I wasn't there. <laughs> got a cow that is, is down in the pen, and you go out and you see lesions like this. What can cause something like that? Pardon? Yeah, I mean, this could be a traumatic type lesion. Blood is very red. But anytime you start seeing nasal hemorrhage in cows, you better be thinking about something like a ruptured pulmonary abscess that ruptures into a vessel and, and you get hemorrhage like this. So be thinking about those type things. And of course, uh, abscesses are very, very common in cattle, and you get a whole wide variety of different organisms. You know, uh, crinibacterium or whatever it's called nowadays is probably the number one cause. Um, Pasteurella, other things, Pseudomonas, there's a variety of different things that cause abscesses in, lung, in, in the lungs of cattle. You got a cow that you uh, go out and you find dead. And it was just down there, it's dead, and that's the only lesion you find in there. Most folks would look at that and say, well, that's agonal hemorrhage and the, the animal just died from natural causes or something. Could be. But in this case, this was the only lesion this animal had and he died of black leg. Clostridium chovii. Sometimes you'll find small lesions in the tongue and that'll be the only thing you'll find in a dead animal. Died of black leg. Sometimes you can find extensive lesions. But once in a while you'll find them very, very small. This is the uh, thigh muscle of a cow. And you can see that it's dark, congested. Areas over here look like air bubbles. If you smelled it, it would smell like a very sweet, rancid butter type smell to it. You could feel the crepitation if it was under the skin here. Black leg. Same thing here. Almost has a, it's a, almost a wet look to it here. Sometimes it has a wet look, and if it becomes a, if it stays around a little longer, oftentimes it's, it turns into something that almost is dry. Black leg lesion. Black leg can affect things other than just the muscle. And this happens to be a black leg. This is the inner surface of the skin. With black leg, probably, there's probably some emphysema in there. This is the colon. Lesion associated with black leg. This is muscle, black leg. So usually I don't associate lesions like this with, with black leg. You may associate lesions under the skin with black leg, but I don't associate other ones with black leg. Okay, another lesion. This happens to be the semimembranosis of a, of a cow. Large area with necrosis. And this happens to be mild degeneration secondary to, to an animal being down for a period of time. Basically an ischemic necrosis. That's why my practitioners rotate or try to rotate animals every four or six hours or whatever. Looking at a heart, obviously, you start seeing these pale areas, pale streaks throughout the heart. And of course, one of the things that ought to go through your mind, first, first of all, when you start seeing white areas in hearts is malignant lymphoma. Well, that's not what this is. This is white muscle disease. When you cut the, the ventricle and look at it, a lot of times you'll find these, these pale areas, maybe widespread, maybe only very small. Sometimes you'll only find a, a small one in one of the auricles. Sometimes it'll be large and, and extensive. 
um, white muscle disease again. White muscle disease in, in calves often becomes mineralized. So it's a, if, you, if you see lesions like that in calves and you cut through it and it has a grittiness to it, it's white muscle disease more than likely. In adult animals, in cows, it's very subtle and you get mineral. Usually with white muscle disease, it gets the more active muscles, the larger muscles, and oftentimes it's bilateral. This happens to be white muscle disease in the heart. You really have a hard time picking up lesions here, but the reason I put this one on is I want to show this heart is not beating properly, and we've got extensive pulmonary edema, secondary to, to heart failure from white muscle disease. Looking at the spinal cord, vertebrae, white muscle disease. Again, like I said, oftentimes it's bilaterally symmetrical. So if you start seeing one, try and look on the other side. If this was, if this was a, a hog, what would you call that? Porcine stress syndrome, right? Pale soft exudative pork or malign malignant hyperthermia or whatever, but look very similar to that. <coughs> muscle on the, this side is normal. And this, this muscle is pale. Cow. I want you to give me two different possible etiologies. You better be thinking toxins on both of them. Menensin? Anything else? Coffee weed. Cassia occidentalis. Both of which will cause lesions similar to this where you get a, you get a mild degeneration and a, a very paleness to the, uh, paleness to the, to the uh, muscle. Sometimes you even get a mild glomenuria. Coffee weed or Casey occidentalis or menensin toxicity. Cattle are, are, are not that susceptible to uh, menensin toxicity. It's more of a problem in horses and dogs. And of course, menensin is used as a, or rumensin is used as a growth promoter and as a coccidiostat. Chickens are very resistant. They, they do get menensin toxicity, but it's very uncommon. Okay, um, another condition in, in uh, cattle. Start looking at muscle like lesions like this. Morphologic diagnosis. Diagnostic. Eosinophilic myositis, my, multifocal eosinophilic and granulomatous myositis. That's what they look like. A lot of times they look like this. It's not always like this. More characteristic that they look like this than, than, than some of the other ones I'm going to show you. And basically what you would what you would see in that would be small areas of necrosis with a ton of eosinophils. And oftentimes, if they become a little older, they'll be surrounded by multinucleated giant cells, and sometimes they'll mineralize. Eosinophilic myositis. Anybody know what the weasen is? I, I didn't even type that one, so. Anybody know what the weasen is? It's esophagus. In, in, in meatpacking terms, it's the esophagus. And they'll call it the weasel or whatever else in, in layman's terms. So that's what that is, the esophagus, OK? And that's eosinophilic myositis, these lesions are. And don't ask me who, where that slide came from. Um, sometimes eosinophilic myositis, and this is an old slide too, it's, it's not a good slide at all. But sometimes you'll find a rather diffuse paleness associated with EM. And if you, if you get to these lesions initially, as soon as the animal is dead and you cut them open, a lot of times these will have a, a green hue to them. Within the first half hour or so, they're green. They kind of have a, a light green, like eosinophils produce something that has a green, green hue to it. So that's eosinophilic myositis. But looking at that, I'd have to say white muscle disease, lymphoma, fibrosis. I couldn't really tell just by looking at that right there. But the other lesions, I would say, are diagnostic. The first ones I show you, showed you are diagnostic for eosinophilic myositis. <clears throat> Bovine, I think this is the round muscle. We have an extensive accumulation of something in there. Anybody know what that is? Steatosis, right. Accumulation of fat in there. Very common in fat in cattle. Same thing here, steatosis. Lesion here, again, in the round muscle of a cow, walled off, looks looks necrotic, green, necrotic, 
walled off by connective tissue. This happens to be an old abs or an old injection site. Initially, you get acute necrosis. Te tetracyclines cause severe problems in muscle. It's highly irritating to, uh, to cattle, and, and you'll get lesions like this. And, and eventually, after a period of several weeks, they look like this. This right here is pathic mnemonic, I would say, or, or dang close to it, these type of lesions. Let's see if I can find one a little better. These type of lesions, the master muscles, diagnosis, cysticercus. Very typical of, of the lesions. Cysticercus bulbus. Well, maybe maybe for your eyes you can't see it. The, the, the First of all, with sarcocystis, it's very difficult to even see sarco in cattle. You can see it in sheep, but in cattle, you very seldom see sarcocystis. Usually they're too small to, to visualize, although there is one out in the western part of the country that, that they're able to see grossly. Most of them are so small you don't see. You see the philic myositis, usually the small lesions are kind of yellow, and sometimes they mineralize. They become, the larger ones become streaky. Lesions of viable cysts of cysticercus are fluid-filled cysts. And like some of you folks in the back I know can't see this, and, and I'm sorry I don't have that. But if you, if you actually looked at these things, you can see through them. And in viable cysts, you can actually see the scolices in there. You can see a little yellow area inside this cyst, in the viable cyst. When these cysts become older, and this, this is a very good question, when these cysts become older, when these parasites become older, usually after about 90 days or so, the body starts recognizing these as abnormal. And you start getting degeneration. You get a granuloma formation. It looks very similar to an old eosinophilic myositis lesion. And once they get old, you cannot do it. And that's one of the things I'm going to show you next year is, is that it was a very good question. Yes, indeed, you cannot differentiate the older lesions of, of cysticercus from eosinophilic myositis. These, again, are some of the lesions. See what I mean about the cysts? If you actually see these things, you can actually see that they're fluid-filled. They have a very thin capsule. And if you really got down and looked at them, you can see in the, in the, in the viable ones, you can see the scolices inside. And as they become older, like I said, the cysts begin to degenerate. And you start getting them walled off, and they become filled with necrotic material. Oftentimes, they're surrounded by giant cells and exudate. And uh, oftentimes, they'll later become mineralized. And I can't tell. A lot of times, in, we have folks in here from our eastern lab in Athens. When we see these under the microscope, we call them caseal calcareous granulomas of undetermined etiology and, and suggest cysticercus, but say they could be EM or, or other type of lesions. And a lot of times, in the real old EM lesions, you won't find many eosinophils in there. So I can't differentiate them in the real old lesions. That was an excellent question. And of course, this is what the adult looks like. Tania saginata parasite of the human GI tract. Okay, um, muscle, normal muscle over here. Diagnosis of that one. It's brown, right? It's like brown atrophy to me. Xanthosis, wear and tear pigment due to the accumulation of lipofusin. Quite common in cattle. It's most common in the heart. Normal heart up here, heart with wear and tear, brown atrophy down here. These things, probably nothing wrong with them. They're condemned for aesthetic purposes. Wear and tear pigment. Heart with a valvular cyst, hematocyst or something. Usually, sometimes they're filled with blood. Sometimes they're, they're uh, fluid filled. Usually, there are no problems. You see them in young calves. That's what they look like sometimes. This one has a little thicker capsule. If you cut into it, it'd just be fluid filled usually causes very little problem for the animal. Heart, serious atrophy, animals getting to the point of emaciation, very common in, in old dairy cattle. That's what, the, what it looks like up close. And of course, anybody who, who enjoys hamburger, the leaner the hamburger, the better the chance it came from an animal that had a heart looked like this. The best hamburgers from the very lean animals, I guess. Um, Bacterial endocarditis caused by strep. Again, like I told you before, the main source of, of bacteremias or pyemias in cattle is from endocarditis, bacterial endocarditis, and from ruptured liver abscesses. 
Another uh, bacterial endocarditis. This was caused by crinibacterium or actinobacillus, I guess they call it nowadays. So, crinibacterium. Heart. Notice how pale this heart looks. We actually, maybe it's, it's almost a little ectric, a little yellow. And we have paintbrush type hemorrhages along the surface. Well, you know, what causes ectris anemia in cattle? When I see this associated with it, normal spleen and a large spleen with blackberry jam type stuff in it, I say anaplasmosis. And that's what you get. You get anemia, you get paintbrush hemorrhages, ectris, and splenomegaly. That's what it looks like. Of course, you'd want to be thinking about lymphoma and other things that cause large spleens in cattle, but they don't usually have the other, other signs associated with it. <clears throat> Diagnosis. Everybody has this condition. Everybody has a set image in their mind of what it's going to be, and it looks like this. Right? Everybody says, hey, that's lumpy jaw. But nobody calls this lumpy jaw, but it is. Lumpy jaw has many different appearances, many different locations. Actinomyces bovis. That's what it looks like. I haven't seen many that look like that, but occasionally they do look. They more commonly look like this. Um, what's the morphologic diagnosis of, of uh, lumpy jaw? What is the lesion? It's an osteomyelitis. Usually you get a lesion around the tooth that starts and gets into the bone and causes an osteomyelitis. You're looking at the ventral surface of, of uh, the jaw, and this is a lesion of lumpy jaw again. Sometimes they do become dehaired like that or exposed. These are also lesions of lumpy jaw. And I've never seen those before. Chuck full of sulfur granules with gram-positive bacteria. But I, I wouldn't be thinking lumpy jaw when I saw that. Actinomyces. Osteomyelitis can happen any place. And this happens to be, again, a, a lesion caused by actinomyces. Same thing that causes lumpy jaw, but you actually have got an osteomyelitis in the bone of the foot. So it can, can cause lesions in other parts of the body. And of course, this is what it looks like. Osteomyelitis, to get an osteomyelitis, we get a, a destruction of the bone, normal bone over here, destruction of the bone over here with replacement by, scar, by fibrous connective tissue. Uh, usually you have sulfur granules in there, neutrophils, and necrotic debris. That's what it looks like. It's an osteomyelitis. And that's what it looks like if you remove all the soft tissues. Um, actinomyces can go areas other than just the jaw. It's very common to find it in the parotid lymph node, and also less common, but we do find it in the lungs. And that's what these are. And the people in the back won't be able to see this, but up here in the front, you can actually start seeing some real small little, little uh, yellow areas that you could actually cut with your knife. These are sulfur granules. You can actually see the sulfur granules from actinomyces, or from lumpy jaw that's uh, spread to the lungs. But most folks, if they looked at that, they'd be calling that a lymphoma or some other type of tumor. But it's not. Um, looking at the side of a tongue, and this is commonly known as wooden tongue. Actinobacillosis. Actinobacillus lignorisi. And sometimes you can see it through the surface. And there again, we're finding little areas of inflammation that would be full of sulfur granules. Anderson antibody complex, plundori hepley reaction. And usually at the center, you find a few gram-negative organisms. That's what they look like. Oftentimes, you get a, a hard tongue that's, that's swollen. You cut through the tongue, you start seeing lesions like this. And I don't know if I can pick out any, any sulfur granules to convince you, but, but when you look at these things real closely, you can start seeing these small little yellow flecks of material that are, that are the sulfur granules. And basically what they are is they're antigen antibody complex, splendori hepley reaction, yeah, that have bacteria around them, or should I say, neutrophils around them, and bacteria in the center. <coughs> One of the lateral incisors of a, of a cow. Diagnosis? Fluorosis. Diagnostic for fluorosis. What makes a diagnostic? What is fluorosis? Well, the first the thing you want to look at for fluor fluorosis is, first of all, the morphologic diagnosis on this would be enamel hypoplasia. What happens is these animals become exposed to, to uh, fluorine, 
during the development period when these teeth are, are being formed out on the jaw, this, this fluorine forms a complex with calcium, and you get calcium, uh, calcium fluoride, and you also get a cal uh, fluoride a appetite. You get a, a complex formation in there, which basically replaces the normal enamel that's, that's forming on this tooth. And you actually start seeing these little chipped out lesions. It becomes very mottled and soft and kind of chalky-like. Diagnostic for, for fluorosis here. The black material or the brown material up here is basically where you've lost your enamel and, and the surface of the tooth under here becomes oxidized. And that's what forms the, the black or the brown on there. But this is an enamel hypoplasia secondary to fluorosis. It's most common in the lateral incisors and also in the premolars. You don't find it in the first teeth because the animals don't get exposed to, to fluorine when the, when the initial teeth are developing. This is an excellent uh, exam slide. Maybe the, the quality of what you try and look at isn't the best, but an eye here, optic chiasma, an eye over here. Arrow pointing to some kind of a stricture right here. Okay, there's, there's only one answer for this one. What, this animal is blind. What's causing this stricture here? Pardon? What if I tell you it has to do with a certain vitamin? Vitamin A deficiency. So what happens? Why is, what, what's causing this? This is a fair board exam question. What's the pathogenesis? Why, what does vitamin A deficiency cause? Or what, why do you need vitamin A? You need vitamin A for normal epithelial cell development. You also need vitamin A for, for normal osteoclastic activity. If you don't have the proper vitamin A, the osteoclasts don't come in. As this, as this bone becomes larger, the osteoclast should go in there and remove bone on the end osteal surface here and open this up. It doesn't do that in the, when you have a vitamin A deficiency, so this ring stays small and the nerve continues to grow and you get a stricture on that nerve and the animal is blind. If this was a horse and you saw lesions you know, where you had strictures like that, that's the, the old uh, lesion that I think John King always talks about where the horse goes up and smashes his head against the top of the trailer, causes a traumatic lesion in, the, in these areas. But this is due to a vitamin A deficiency. <clears throat> Normal rib, abnormal rib, rickets. <clears throat> Don't have normal flaring. It's kind of hard to tell, hard to appreciate here, but there should be a little more flaring in through here. But the, the thing we're looking at here is an increased thickness of the growth plate, and it's an irregular growth plate. And in cattle, usually this is associated with either a phosphorus deficiency or a deficiency of vitamin D. <coughs> what would be the morphologic? I suppose it's an osteodystrophy, right? I, I assume that you would call it an osteodystrophy. It's actually, actually an osteomalacia, too, which is, which is a term that uh, you'd expect to find. Any Osteomalacia and rickets are, are similar. The only difference between rickets and osteomalacia is in rickets you have to have a growth plate, and you have to have uh, a, an open growth plate, a growing growth plate. Diagnosis. This, is a, this has got to be a board slide right here. The humerus from, a, from an Angus Aberdeen calf. Osteopetrosis. Autosomal recessive condition of Angus Aberdeen calves, also seen in Semitol, Hereford. I think it's been seen in Holsteins. Like I said, autosomal recessive. For some reason, the osteoclasts do not reabsorb the primary and secondary bony trabeculae in the spongiosa, and you start getting bones that look like this. Usually, they're, they're fairly normal shaped, but they're very brittle. And what you get is a, a continued persistence of, the, of bony trabecula that go down all the way through into the diaphysis. And if you looked at it histologically, that's what you get. You get the growth plate over here, and you get these very thin spicules of bone that just continue all the way down and fill the whole bone, uh, bone marrow space. Osteopetrosis, autosomal recessal due to uh, osteoclast problem. And I'll tell you, this was on boards a few years ago when I took it. And when I ask you the same question they ask us, they said, uh, give three things that can cause this. Three diseases, three etiologies, or whatever. And we're not talking about congenital 
contracted tendons. I mean, we're not, that's, not a, that's not an answer that I would accept on that one. And when you start seeing things like this, the three things that should come to your mind are, first of all, Akabani disease. First of all, what's, what's the name of this condition? Arthrogryphosis, crooked joint. Okay, you should think of Akabani virus, which causes crooked calf syndrome. You should think of things like blue tongue. And the third one that would come to my mind would be lupinosis, toxicity from the consumption of lupines. All three will cause lesions very similar to this. And that was a, a board exam slide several years ago. So that just kind of gives you a flavor for, for what may appear. Uh, I'll just put this one on here to show that, that this is a, an osteomyelitis of the vertebral column. And uh, this one had necrovasculosis. So we see a fair number of things like that, too. Foot and leg of an animal that's opened up. This is a fair slide, too, and, and I'm sure they would ask you for a list of morphologic diagnoses, and you'd have about four or five of them in there. You know, you'd find a, a pododermatitis and tenosynovitis and the whole, you can, oste osteomyelitis, a whole list of different things you'd want to call in there. And then they're going to ask you about uh, the name of the condition and uh, the etiology and pathogenesis. And of course, the name of the condition is going to be fescue foot. And the etiology is, is uh, from the consumption of, of fescue grasses. And what about fescue grasses causes this toxicity? Well, fescue grasses in certain parts of the country and in certain environmental conditions are, are contaminated with a fungal endophyte. And this fungal endophyte is called uh, Acrimonium coenophyllum. And don't ask me to spell it, okay? Acrimonium coenophyllum. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it right. But this fungal endophyte produces certain uh, compounds that somehow cause gangrenous necrosis of the extremities like this. There's, there's three things associated with fescue toxicosis. One of them is fescue foot. Another one is, is decreased production and, and uh, heat intolerance. And the third one is fat necrosis. So there's several things caused by, by fescue toxicosis as a complex. And of course, ergotism will, will give lesions similar to this too, which is a, a dry gangrene type thing from, from eating Plavisteps pur purpura, estrogenic compounds. Any questions on fescue toxicosis? <clears throat> Got a cow here, and, and this animal's been outside. We're, I'm trying to get to, to an early sign of photosensitivity. And this, is, this is really an early case. And this is a later case where we have a photosensitivity up here in the white-haired area, white white area. And this one happened to have been contaminated with maggots secondary to, to the, the initial lesion. The reason I put that on is because that's fairly commonly seen in a condition known as porphyria or pink tooth. These animals, you've got to keep them inside, or if, they're, if they have any white, they're going to have photosensitivity. What causes photosensitivity? In, in in uh, porphyria, the animals are deficient in an enzyme called uroporphenogen 3 cosynthetase. And basically what happens is they do not metabolize uh, the porphyrins, right? Porphyrins are used in heme. They do not metabolize them, right? And the porphyrins circulate throughout the system. They get in the skin. The skin becomes uh, sensitized or the skin becomes uh, exposed to ultraviolet rays. That causes these porphyrins to be, become excited. They let off energy and they cause necrosis of the skin. Well, what else we see is pink tooth. And this is really a classic one. A lot of times they're not nearly this pink. This is what they look like sometimes. They almost don't even look pink unless you get them in the right light. They just kind of have that, that pinkish hue to them, but they don't really have the, the deep pink color. You get lesions like this. Look at all the bones. Just a, a massive uh, discoloration. It used to be called osteohemochromatosis, which I don't think is an acceptable term anymore. But that's what you look like. And, and you can see these. Most commonly see it in cattle, but uh, porphyria is also seen in swine. Most people, they get black bones or brown bones or red bones in swine. They say, God, what is it? That's porphyria. This is, what the, this is a proximal femur, and we're looking through the, through the cortex, and that's what they look like. Same thing here. Cut femur. And of course, the diagnostic procedure is, is to expose this to ultraviolet rays under the UV light, and they fluoresce. And that's diagnostic for porphyria. Of course, you can do this on other tissues as well as on the urine. 
If you have urine and you put it under UV light, it'll, it'll light up like that. Um, just put this on to, to show you, yes, indeed, cattle get ringworm, trachophyton, very common. Humans get it from cattle. So it is a zoonotic condition. This right here is a good board slide. Um, you're looking at the, the ventral abdomen, the midline of a bull. Only one thing I know that causes this lesion, and it's in every bull you find almost. Stephanofilarius telesi, parasitic dermatitis. The organism, the nematode, gets in here and migrates around in the, in the deep dermis and causes a proliferative and, and a dermatitis type lesion in there. Stephanofilarius telesi. That's the carcass. You got the carcass up here. The skin's going, being pulled off this direction. Diagnosis? Hypoderma, hypoderma bulbus, or lineatum. I can't tell what the difference is here. Where else would you maybe expect to find some lesions associated with this? Esophagus or spinal cord? That's exactly right. There's the other two tissues you want to look at. And here's what, what some of the degenerate grubs look like coming out of there. This is the, the inner surface of the skin, and that's what they look like when they peel out. These things cause major problems for the packers because they, you know, the packers get paid. Uh, probably the most profit a packer makes is on the hide. And when you get a major grub problem in the hide, they downgrade the, the, the hide's value, and, and the packers lose a lot of money because of that. So grubs are big problems. Uh, pancreas. This is a very common condition in cattle. This is just nodular hyperplasia. See it very common in old animals. Don't know what the cause is, and it apparently doesn't seem to affect the animal at all. It's just a incidental finding, nodular hyperplasia. And these are pancreatic stones. I would say that we very, very rarely see these. They're just kind of a gee whiz type lesion, more of the same thing, pancreatic uh, stones, calculi. Got a cow here. I'm going to check you out a little bit. I want you, you obviously, you're looking at the eye. And this is a board question, and I'm, I'm going to show you this one, and I'm going to show you the next one, and I'm going to ask you what the problem is, and maybe, maybe if that could be associated with any kind of a syndrome. Okay, this is a normal eye. It's this eye, the one you just looked at. Like I said, look, compare back and forth. If you look over here, the iris doesn't have any melanin, right? So, I mean, maybe this is just an albino animal. Look back here, you don't have any, any pigment in the back part of the retina. Maybe it's just an albino animal. Maybe it's not. Maybe this is a, a cat or some other animal, and, and you get lesions like this. What, what syndrome could that be associated with? Chidi Ekagashi, exactly what I wanted you to tell me. I don't know whether that was or not in this case, but that's, that's the kind of thought process you need to go through when you see something like this. Okay, um, just another lesion. We, we're looking at the chest cavity of a cow, and we find massive areas of hemorrhage. What causes lesions like that in cattle? And you think of DIC, you think of sweet clover intoxication. This happens to be bracken fern. Bracken fern will cause extensive hemorrhage throughout the, the whole carcass. And I'm sure there are probably several other things that will cause extensive hemorrhage like that, but you need to kind of have a, a list of different differentials to go through your mind when you start seeing lesions like this. I'm going to go through just a couple other lesions here to kind of say, well, gee whiz, what is that? And, and just to kind of refresh your memory a little bit on, on certain conditions. Calf, top of the head, open fontanelle. Seen those before. Bovine brain, apparently normal brain over here, cerebellum. Diagnosis on this one? Lysencephaly. Lysencephaly doesn't have to be bilateral. It can be unilateral like that. We don't have any normal, we don't have any folds. Two-month-old calf, lesion in, in the cerebellum and the cerebrum. I'm going to tell you it's neoplastic. Anybody got a diagnosis now? Medulloblastoma. See that in a calf, usually you find it in the cerebellum. 
medulloblastoma. Brain, what's going on here? Herniation, cerebellar herniation. The frame and magnum. Spinal cord, diagnosis, syringomyelia. Brain here, brain abscess. This one happened to be secondary to dehorning. So, I mean, abscesses can get there from a variety of ways, and this one was from dehorning. And that was necrobacillosis, fusobacterium necrophorum. Diagnosis? I, you know, I couldn't really tell by looking at that. That happens to be an epidermal hematoma. It could be hemangiosarcoma. I don't know what else it could be. Epidermal hematoma. Could be a lymphoma. Usually you wouldn't find them nearly that red, but that's a good location for a lymphoma. Diagnosis? Period of meningitis caused by E. coli. Again, you don't see any white down here. You see all the cloudiness, the edema. This is also a meningitis caused by E. coli. Notice the edema and the congestion of, of, the, of the meningeal vessels. Spinal cord opened up with extensive exudate along the inner surface. This happens to be a salmonella meningitis, purely meningitis, secondary to salmonella. Highly diagnostic slide right here. Normal brain. What's going on in that brain? I'll show you another one. Polio. Polio is a, it's polioencephalomalacia is a gross term. It means gross yellowing and softening of the white, or of the gray matter, and that's what you've got here is yellowing, softening. Normal brain, shrunken. Same thing here, polio. Etiology, thymine deficiency. Same thing here, polio. You actually have very little gray matter out here. What's the diagnostic test you can do for polio? Ultraviolet light. Diagnosis? Thromboembolic meningoencephalitis by Haemophilus somnus. Histologic lesion. Basically, you have a in hemorrhagic infarct usually. And you're going to almost always find fibrin thrombi in the vessels. And oftentimes, you'll find bacteria associated with those thrombi. Same thing here. Doesn't just get the, the cerebrum. Can get any place in the CNS. Same thing right there. That was form one fixed. And this happens to be in the spinal cord. So don't just think that you can get TB in the, in, the, in the brain. It can happen in the spinal cord as well. <clears throat> Excellent case here. This one is, is one that's very difficult. You, in fact, you wouldn't make this diagnosis. And you start seeing uh, extensive peritonitis, right? And that's, that's the only thing you could diagnose that as is a peritonitis. Of course, you'd want to rule out your other things like neoplasms, right? And uh, you look at lesion like this, obviously that's a FIP in a cow, right? Uh, it's chronic peritonitis is what you'd have to diagnose that. But I'm just going to show you that this is tuberculosis, and so isn't this. But I'd never diagnose it. This is a histologic diagnosis. It's not a gross diagnosis. And, and one of the reasons I want to put this on is TB lesions don't all of a sudden appear in the classic form. They've got to get there somehow. And so they go through a series of stages. And don't, don't necessarily think that if it's not classic, it's not TB. So I think there are still a fair number of TB lesions out there that aren't diagnosed. This is TB. God, I'd never diagnose that as TB. I don't know what I'd diagnose. It looks almost like a neoplasm, maybe. But I wouldn't diagnose it as TB. And this is TB in the lung. You know, it's not casio calcareous like you expect to find TB. But that's TB. Mycobacterium bulbus. Uterus is not an uncommon spot to find tuberculosis, too. And you can find some irregularities. And when you open it up, you see lesions like this. And that's got tuberculosis. So it can appear in a wide variety of different locations. This happens to be the lung. And this is more typical. This is pearl disease. Anybody can diagnose this one, especially when you start seeing that yellow granular material, I mean, that's diagnostic almost for, for pearl disease for tuberculosis. But there are other things you'd have to consider in your diagnosis if you didn't see that. And I'll show you those in a minute. 
And of course, this right here, you know, my, my four-year-old can diagnose that as TB. And of course, this is tuberculosis, obviously. And these things are tuberculosis, although sometimes you'll even get a, a squamous cell carcinoma that will have this look to it. But it won't have mineralization to it. And here again, this is tuberculosis. This is the classic lesion. So tuberculosis is out there, and, and we just need to be on the outlook for it. <clears throat> okay, um, I see a lesion like this. I've got one diagnosis that's going to come to my mind first, and everything else is, is down a little lower. This maybe is not typical, but basically I, we, got, we have an exophthalmus, what I'm trying to show here. And an exophthalmus in a, a Holstein dairy cow, and if you don't call that a lymphoma, there's, there's some problem associated with that. What, what's the lesion associated with, with lymphoma and exophthalmus? What causes exophthalmus in, in uh, cattle in, with lymphoma? Where's the lesion? Retrovulvar lymph nodes. Right, you get lymphoma associated back there and it forces the eyes out. Sometimes you can get bilateral exophthalmus from lymphoma. I got, I've got a whole series of slides of lymphoma here. And I just put those on to, to show you lymphoma can happen any place, any time. And one of the things, as, as I'm thinking about that, is a couple years ago I was talking with a veterinarian, and, and he wanted to diagnose a case as a lymphoma. And he says, I've, you know, there's been several times I wanted to diagnose conditions as lymphoma, but he says, I know it can't be a lymphoma because lymph nodes weren't involved. I mean, you know, I don't know how common a belief like that is, but I think that it's more common than, than I'd like to, to think it is. So uh, lymphoma can happen any place, any time. Typical lesion in the kidney of lymphoma. But if you remember an hour ago, I showed you a white spotted kidney that, God, when I cut it open, it looked just like this. Like the lymphoma. Same thing. One of the things about lymphomas is usually when you, when you cut them and you take your knife and you, you peel it across the edge of a cut lymphoma like this, usually you kind of get a yellow material or ooze that kind of sticks to the surface. So it doesn't feel like connective tissue. And it, and especially in an organ like this. Sometimes if you're in muscle or something, then you can't do that. But, but an organ like this or a lymph node, a lot of times you can kind of feel the, the different textures there. Now this one right here, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to call this a lymphoma, but it was. You know, if, you, if you're not thinking lymphomas, you're going to say, hey, are those hemorrhagic infarcts or, or what are they? I don't know. And of course, lymphomas can happen in a wide variety of places. Th these are the ureters with lymphoma. And sometimes you get a hydronephrosis or whatever associated with that. But if you're not thinking about it, you don't look at the ureters. This is a very common spot for lymphoma, the uterus. And when you do a cut section of that, the wall is just thickened. And unlike adenocarcinomas, this would have a very soft feel to it, very pliable feel to it, unlike uh, adenocarcinomas, which are much more scarce. Normal spleen, lymphoma spleen. A little while ago, I showed you an anaplasmosis and said, hey, this looks very similar to that. Can't tell the difference. The heart is a real common spot to find lymphomas. And this happens to be one of the, one of the oracles. And you just get that, that real light, pale look to it. And you know that the muscle has been replaced by something. Now, I didn't, didn't bring the slides along, but I've got a couple slides where I have, have a lymphoma in the heart and a white muscle disease in the heart. And I can't tell the difference. I mean, they look. You've know, you got to look at them histologically to be able to differentiate the two. That's a lymphoma. This is a, a very large liver. And, uh, you know, just looking at it, you may say, well, that's a fatty liver or something. And this is, apologize, this is a little bit out of focus. But that's not a fatty liver, that's a lymphoma. Sometimes lymphomas are very diffuse like this. Sometimes they, they form discrete nodules. So lymphomas are, respond differently. These are lymphomas in the lung. Sometimes they form nodules, sometimes they just just kind of infiltrate in the parenchyma and do not form nodular growths. Lymphoma in the small intestine. Looks more like an adenocarcinoma. Abomasal lymphoma. Folds of the abomasum are a very common spot to find lymphomas. Omasal. Oops. Omasal lymphoma. Again, they all have the, the same type look to them. A very common spot to find lymphomas is, is associated with the spinal cord. Usually they're outside the cord, they're in the vertebral canal, and they get lesions like this that put pressure on the cord. A lot of times you'll find, find uh, cattle, especially dairy cattle, that'll be down there bright and alert, they're trying to get up, and you can't find out what's wrong with them. You go in and you do a post on them, 
And if you look at the spinal cord and actually go down through there, sometimes you'll find lesions that are only the size of your smallest knuckle. And they'll be putting pressure on the cord, and that's how come the animals are down. But if you don't do a complete pulse, you'll miss those kind of lesions. <clears throat> this is an excellent condition. This is a, a common condition of cattle. We have uh, one, uh, one of our slaughter veterinarians out in, in Kansas a couple years ago did a study in this condition. He had 30,000 animals, range cattle, basically, that went through his plant. And out of those 30,000 animals, he found 15 of these. And if you, if you look at these, you know, ah, it's proud flesh or granulation tissue or whatever else. Well, it's not. What happens in, in cattle in this location quite often? Injection could be. They get branded right here. You ever heard of brand cancer? Brand cancer is a condition that's very common in cattle. Brand cancers are usually squamous cell carcinomas. What happens is these animals get, get branded. It uh, elicits a chronic inflammatory response, continues to, to uh, uh, have this inflammatory response, turns metaplastic and neoplastic. And you get squamous cell carcinomas. And that's where you see most of them at. Brand cancers, that's what, the, what they look like. Dermal squamous cell carcinomas. Yes, indeed, they do metastasize. This is the skin with squamous cell carcinoma. These are regional lymph nodes with metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. If you're not looking for them, you won't find them. You'll, you'll kind of look past them and say, some of them even look like uh, one animal defecated on the other one. If you're not really looking at them, you're doing a, say you're in a, in a slaughter facility doing anamortem, you say, hey, it's just some kind of a, of a traumatic wound or some type. So you need to be aware of that. This is also a, a cow We're looking at the vulva. This is squamous cell carcinoma. White tissue back here. It doesn't have to be around the eye. It doesn't have to be a Hereford. We see a number of squamous cell carcinomas in, in uh, Angus and Holsteins. And oftentimes we'll find them metastatic to the parotid lymph node with no, no visible sign of, of initial lesion around the eye. So we don't know where they're coming from in, in Angus and Holstein, but we do find them. And of course, this is squamous cell carcinoma of the third eyelid. There's tens of thousands of animals condemned every year for squamous cell carcinomas. Same thing here. These things are, are not uncommon at federal slaughterhouses. And the guy will come in and he say, yeah, doc, that just happened yesterday. <laughs> be surprised how many of these things. They'll be full of maggots. He says, got wounded on the truck, doc. Better pass her. Those things do metastasize. Uh, in, uh, this is a parotid lymph node, what the lesions look like. Usually an initial lesion of squamous cell carcinoma, if you're looking for them, you don't start looking down here. Most of your lesions are going to be right under the capsule. For the early metastatic lesions, you look in the lymphatic spaces under the capsule, and that's where you'll find your, your early embolic foci. <clears throat> Another one, this is, uh, you know, like I said, these are very easy. These almost look like they have sulfur granules in them. And these are keratin pearls, but they look like sulfur granules. And, and I've seen a number of cases where I've looked at parotid lymph nodes, and I've found actinomycosis and metastatic squamous cell carcinoma in the same nodes. So, I mean, just because you have one doesn't mean you can't have another one. Make a nice board slide, too, right? And, of course, they do go to the lungs sometimes, metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. It's not that common that they go to the lungs. And we've seen them in the, in the heart and in the kidney and, and in other areas throughout the carcass, so they don't always go the way you would expect that they would. Um, bovine uterus, uterine adenocarcinoma, common in cattle. Many of our lung tumors come from, from uterine adenocarcinomas. And oftentimes, the, the adenocarcinomas in the, in the uterus are very small. So in other words, they metastasize fairly rapidly to the lungs and regional lymph nodes. Sometimes with, with uh, uterine adenocarcinomas, you start seeing star-shaped or indented type lesions associated with them. They're a very scarce type tumor. And, and here you kind of get the stellate type lesion. This happens to be a, the inner surface of the uterus with a squamous cell, or with a adenocarcinoma, uterine adenocarcinoma. Like I said, they're very scarce type tumors. Remember before I showed you a, a lymphoma in the uterus that was very soft looking? Well, this looks like it would cut very hard. And this is a uterine adenocarcinoma. We're looking at the wall of the uterus there. And instead of going into the lumen, oftentimes they invade into the musculature. Surface of the spleen. Showed you a little while ago, you know, I said, well, it could be pearl disease. This happens to be a metastatic uterine adenocarcinoma. 
could be a lymphoma. I couldn't tell. It could be a chronic peritonitis. I don't know what that is. Gross lymph. This is the, the liver with a metastatic uterine adenocarcinoma. But I'd be hard pressed not to call those abscesses. And this is a lung with a metastatic uterine adenocarcinoma. And again, notice how this, this looks like it's tough. It looks like it would cut hard. So anytime you start seeing lesions that are very tough in the bovine and the lungs, be thinking about uterine adenocarcinoma. If it's a cow, go on back and take a look. Okay, showed you the spleen a few minutes ago of an animal that had a metastatic uterine adenocarcinoma. Looks very similar to this, but this happens to be a mesothelioma. And I want to tell you that, that uh, all mesotheliomas are not benign. Sometimes we get mesotheliomas that, are, that have invaded organs, or we get them in, that have metastasized to other, other uh, parts of the body. They're in lymph nodes. So just because it's mesothelioma, don't say, hey, it's benign, don't worry about it. So that's mesothelioma. This is chronic peritonitis. So I'm, I'm putting these things on to confuse you, but to basically say you can't tell what they are, and you've got to do histopath on it. I can't tell the difference on those things. It could be a lymphoma. This is the uterus of a cow. Just a large granulosa cell tumor. They have a very, very typical appearance. A lot of times they're, they're multilocular with a lot of cystic type spaces filled with fluid, sometimes filled with necrotic debris, hemorrhage. This is a granulosa cell tumor that's opened up. Hemorrhagic cysts, areas of necrosis. Sometimes they become very large, basketball size. Okay, I, I told you before, you know, one of the things we saw in the, in the heart was, was uh, cystocircus. Now, one of the things you'd have to rule out here is cystocircus. And with cystocircus, you've cut, and with this one here, you've cut through a mass. And it's like this throughout. There's no fluid in there. So that kind of rules out cystocircus. This is, this is characteristic and diagnostic for nerve sheath tumors, neurofibromas. Classic position form, classic appearance, diagnostic. Nothing else that I'm aware of looks like that. Oftentimes, you find them along the ribs. You'll find just these little elevations inside the ribs, along some of the nerve tracts along the ribs. Sometimes they become very large, and this is what they look like. They kind of, there again, they're kind of hard and firm, but they almost look edematous, too. And they, they just cut like nervous tissue, they, but they're, they're harder than, than cutting through a brain or a cord. And they can happen any place you've got nerve tissue, and this happens to be the liver, the nerve sheath tumor, neurofibroma. And also, I would say that, that in our field laboratories, um, we probably get hundreds of these a year, and we probably have a half a dozen that are malignant, that are full of mitotic figures that are, that are metastasized and are invasive. So just because you know it's a, it's a neurofibroma, a nerve tissue origin tumor, doesn't mean it's a benign tumor. Let's put this on to show a papilloma. I'm getting down towards the end of our slides here, folks. So. Papillomas can happen in other areas, and this happens to be a papilloma in the rumen. So they don't just happen, happen in the skin. I showed you before, I told you before that they happen in the trachea sometimes and those areas like that. Bovine penis with a fibro papilloma. Kidney. One of the one of the most common tumors, one of the common, most common growths sent into to our laboratories from, from slaughterhouses. Uh, the veterinarian will send something in and he said, Doc, I got this kidney tumor. It's a great big tumor, full of necrotic debris, and, and there's some exudate in there. And it's got to be a renal cell carcinoma or something. And first thing we ask him is, well, what did the adrenal gland look like? Because almost invariably, it's an adrenal tumor. And this happens to be a pheochromocytoma. And sometimes they can become very large and cystic like this, and necrotic. And oftentimes, they're associated right with a kidney, so, the, so people aren't thinking about the adrenal gland. And of course, pheochromocytomas invade the vena cava, lesions like this, and from there they can rupture and go on to other parts of the body. So they, they can be malignant. And of course, this is what a pheochromocytoma look like often. It's normal, this is the adrenal gland over here. You can see some of the cortex, cortex along here. And adrenal pheochromocytomas oftentimes have this, this necrotic and hemorrhagic look to them. But adrenal cortical tumors sometimes are very difficult to differentiate between. You know, it's hard to, hard to look at a tumor and say that one's a pheo and that one's a cortical tumor. Sometimes, I, I don't know if this is an accurate statement or not, but I tend to think if I, if I see mineral in it, if I cut mineral, I'm thinking more about adrenal cortical than I am pheo, but I don't know if that's true or not. One of, our, one of our colleagues is doing some work on that. He may be able to tell me the answer to that one down the line here. 
But adrenal cortical tumors also invade into the major vessels, and from there they go to other parts of the body. So that's, that's what's happening here. It's neoplastic or metastatic lesion, invasive lesion. This is the last slide I've got to show you. And I put this one on. Uh, yesterday, Dr. Carpenter, when he was talking about cats, he showed you a lot of cat spleens and, and other things that had a certain look to them, a certain color to them. And by the time he got done, everybody knew they were mast cell tumors, right? This is a bovine mast cell tumor. And we've probably diagnosed a half a dozen or more of these. And every one of them has had this lesion, this look. They get that, that kind of an orange, off-colored orange-brown look to them. And of course, mast cell tumors, they can be highly malignant in cattle. And uh, I think, I think uh, Monox are uh, about, I think about 3% of all cutaneous tumors in cattle are diagnosed as mast cell tumors. So mast cell tumors cause skin lesions as well as lesions. Most of the ones that we've seen are not coming from the skin. They're coming from the abdominal cavity and they produce lesions like this. But anytime you start seeing a, a yellow, orange, brown lesion like that, it's a mast cell tumor until proven otherwise.